Coming up this week on the MarkCast, it is BC Lions season, America's CFL team here. I have my BC Lions hat on, talking all sorts of CFL. We also have your USFL Week 10 preview, XFL stuff as well. We have a stacked five guest lineup this week. First and foremost, Greg Parks, longtime friend of the show from XFL Board, who is a new friend of the show. Uh, Greg is literally probably driving to the XFL floor of the showcase as you listen to this episode. Lots of new XFL stuff to break into with Greg. All these partnerships that are advantageous to players, such as the one the XFL announced today, that's something that, you know, when you have that scale of USFL, XFL, it's something that players and agents can put on the XFL side and and the XFL hopes it'll weigh more in their favor when these players and agents are deciding which way to go. Then, you know, we are America's premier CFL podcast. We are talking BC Lions, CFL Week 2, everything else. We have Tim Baines of the Ottawa Sun coming on the program to see the a red blacks team that won just three games a year ago go toe-to-toe with the defending great cup champions and we get a rematch of that this week uh, with ottawa and then Keon Hatcher, one of the stars of the BC Lions route of the Edmonton Elks last Saturday for their home opener at BC Place. The crowd came out and they, they had an electrifying out there, man. It was a really good night. It was fun. And um, it's one to remember for sure. Then we're still talking USFL stuff. Week 10, we have USFL historian Paul Reese stopping by the show. I think the main takeaway, particularly after the midseason meltdowns of the Alliance of American Football and XFL 2.0, is that we're at the final week. And then Coach Craig of Coach Craig Sports gives his thoughts about the USFL All-Team, whatever that's called, uh, previewing the weekend's games, talking USFL playoffs and more. When we watched the XFL, there was guys, there were, you know, Jordan Tiamo, PJ Walker, and Josh Johnson kind of took over where they were the three higher up guys. We didn't really see that quite as much with the USFL. And even like in the case of Jordan Tiamo, I think he actually probably played worse in the USFL than he did in the XFL. A little under the weather this week. Hope we're all getting through this together. Thank you guys for your support. Hey guys, welcome to the MarkCast. Reed here. want to thank you so much for coming by today. If you're returning after our big commissioner, uh, Randy Ambrosi, interview last week, thank you so much for checking out the episode again. Lots of stuff to get to this week in the world of the CFL, XFL, and USFL. Uh, Longtime YouTube listeners will know that I have gotten a new front tooth. I had fallen and broken my front tooth over a year ago. It's been uh, quite the process. I have braces. And I've had a temporary tooth for a long time. This is a new temporary tooth. It should be getting my full grill put back together here, I think in four weeks. I think it's the timeline, but uh, I gained a new tooth and then I got a cold sore and I got sick this week. So, uh, you know, it's the best of times. It's the worst of times, but we are getting through everything. Uh, Five guests for you guys today. If you like the work that we're doing here, please uh, make sure and subscribe. We have officially crossed, uh, well now crossed, the 2,000 subscriber mark. So that means that at the end of the show today, I will fill you guys in on how to you know, get your chance to win some of the items. We'll go through the items that we have and then talk about how you can enter to win those. So make sure you uh, check out at the end. And if you are not subscribed, you're still eligible to, you know, once you have to subscribe, but if you're not subscribed yet, but you subscribe, uh, we'll get you part of that giveaway at the end of the show. Uh, big guest list today. We have Greg Parks of XFL board coming on the show. Greg is headed to the XFL showcase this weekend in Florida. Uh, Greg also has lots of thoughts about the OC and, uh, you know, the offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator and DPPs that were hired by the XFL last week. Uh, Greg and I also talk about kind of timeline stuff here, getting into the summer in terms of which should we expect the XFL cities here with the showcases and everything going on? Really appreciate that extended interview with Greg Parks. Really appreciate him coming on. Lots of CFL stuff today. Uh, I have my BC hat uh, on, BC Lions hat. It is BC Lions season, I think is what I'm going to call the episode today. Really excited about all of the... Um, energy coming out of BC following their big victory, the uh, 59 to 15 victory against the Edmonton Elks on Saturday at their home opener. A little surprised that the CFL social media didn't highlight that more. I I called them out today on Twitter. They have a week one recap of all the games and noticeably absent was the the big BC Lions one. So kind of weird there. Talk with uh, Tim about all of that stuff. Tim, um, 
Baines coming on the show. Uh, Tim covers uh, the Ottawa Red Blacks, talking through the Jeremiah Mazzolis of it all. You know, we, we, are they sad? Uh, are Ty Cats fans sad that Dane Evans is their quarterback, seeing the numbers that Jeremiah Mazzoli put up last weekend? Uh, we preview CFL Week 2. The Argos are playing right now in their home opener against the Alouettes as I record this. Uh, lots of good stuff with Tim. We have Keon Hatcher coming on. Keon is a, a wide receiver for the BC Lions. Really appreciate Matt getting him involved. Uh, he was part of the, Keon was part of the big, you know, obviously victory in BC last week. He is on vacation in Houston at a hotel with his family and he took the time to come on the show. Really appreciate that. I mean, that's the thing, guys, with these, you know, USFL, CFL, XFL players, like uh, taking the time out. He's on vacation on the bye week. Doesn't have to do any of that. Really appreciate that. And obviously for Matt Baker, getting all of that scheduled during the BC Lions off uh, off week, the bye week when you know everyone's kind of out of town. And then we still have USFL stuff. We are approaching week ten here. You know, is it the poo poo weekend? I don't know what to expect this weekend. You know, we have guys now uh, being able to pursue. USFL or uh, NFL contracts, if they're under USFL uh, contracts, you know, per Aaron Wilson and things we've talked about before. I got in trouble on social media today about that. But um, are, are there going to be a lot of guys playing this weekend? Are we resting the starters? What are we doing with that? We have Paul Reese of uh, USFL Historian coming on. Paul and I do a deep dive. And then we had the USFL, like all USFL teams, offense, defense, all of that released today. So Coach Craig of uh, Coach Craig Sports joins me as well to kind of do all of that stuff with the USFL preview in the playoffs, you know, talking week 10 and all of that stuff. So we have Greg Parks, Tim Baines, Keon Hatcher, Paul Reese, and then um, Coach Craig Sports coming on the show. If you can't tell, my head's a little fuzzy on a lot of cold medicine right now, but uh, trying to get through this. I'm sure I've rambled long enough at this point, and hopefully it's coherent enough. If You'll have to play the game today. Which interviews were recorded before Reed was sick and which ones weren't? Uh, be interested to see. Hope everyone enjoys today. Like I said, I'll come back at the end. We'll do the big... Uh, preview for the giveaway. Like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. I got some good stuff set up for next week. I'm going to be out of town, so I might have to do a couple interviews remote, and then we'll come back into town next Thursday. Uh, Dorothy gets out of school this week, so we're going to go to Vegas uh, for a couple days, go see a Chris Angel double feature. Uh, very excited about that. But I'll be back on Thursday. We'll get everything put back together for the show next Friday. Thanks as always, and take care. Well, I am podcasting a little ill today. I'm a little under the weather. So, Greg, you might have to carry a little bit of this. I might mute a lot when it comes to the sniffling. It's not what, you know, it's, it, this is a cold. This is, you know, it is what it is. I thought Trust it was, me, I've been there. I've been there. <laughs> yeah, but everyone's worried. They're like, stay away. I'm like, well, no, it's just like allergies. It's cold. We have Greg Parks here. Uh, XFL Board has now unblocked us on Twitter. Where Mark follows us now. I think that we're making like amends all, all around the board. So welcome, friend of the program now, Greg Parks of XFL Board. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well. I'd love to take credit for the unblocking by XFL Board, but that uh, that wasn't my doing. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's a good day. It's a good day when that happens. Yeah, this is good. So we're going to get Greg back on during the summer. Uh, it works out. Greg's a teacher like my wife, you know, has a little bit of, you know, still a busy man, but not, you know, working the nine to five every day. But I wanted to get Greg on. He's heading to, you know, summer vacation for a little bit. I want to get Greg's thoughts on all the OC, DC hires, everything from last week, the DPPs. I know Greg uh, has written about that. And then Greg is actually headed to the uh, Florida Showcase on Sunday for the XFL. So we'll talk through that. And then this new breakaway data partnership and anything else we want today. How does that sound? That sounds great. Uh, so I guess first off, and we were kind of pre-talking about this. So XFL announced a partnership with Breakaway Data. They're calling it an innovative, high-performance sports company. It's by the guy that like founded EA Sports. I had a listener, Seth, was trying to send me all this stuff. What do you make of this new partnership today? Well, I think, you know, Breakaway Data is sort of the leader from what it sounds like in this arena in terms of, uh, you know, the the speed and the all the measurements that uh, players go through while they are working out, while they are uh, at practice. You know, you've seen um, the Senior Bowl this year. And Pro Football Focus, I think, would post like the fastest time of uh, a player, a wide receiver running routes or something like that. And that's the kind of data that I think uh, the 
this uh, group will be accumulating for the XFL. And, you know, to me, I thought the most interesting thing about it was that this data is going to go to the players. So it's not going to just go to the XFL to sit in a file somewhere. It's not even just going to go to the coaches so that they can see um, beyond what their eyes tell them about practice, beyond just, you know, how many catches someone had, how many drops someone had at practice. It's going to tell them, you know, who's exerting the most energy at practice and things like that. And it's going to go to the players. Uh, they're going to have that data. So I, I think that's going to be an interesting tool for the players to understand how they uh, can better practice, how they can better work out, and just things like that to make themselves better. So uh, I think that's a really cool feature of this partnership that was announced today. Well, also, you know, the whole thing, we cover the spring league and all that, you know, and that was always the issue there is I heard that some players, you know, you'd pay and you'd be a part of it, you get your tape, and then it was challenging to get that sent out, or, you know, you're kind of relying on the league to do your own PR for you in terms of like sending stuff to the necessary agencies. And yeah, if you have access to all of that, um, I did see a lot of like, well, this is just another partnership for the XFL, even though like uh, I have a plethora of emails from the USFL talking about all of their partnerships and agreements and everything that they're working with. But I think people are frustrated mm -hmm. with this. Like, oh, it's just another on the pile of partnerships the XFL is doing. Yeah, I don't see a problem with it. <laughs> you know, if they're if they're proud of it and and they want people to know about it and they want I mean, this is as much for players and agents really as it is for the public like you and I or even people that cover the XFL. It's to sort of give players and agents an idea of what they can expect from this league because, you know, next year they're going to have to decide if they're not in an NFL um, practice squad or or anything like that come um you know, the fall, uh, they're going to have to decide between the USFL and the XFL if they want to stay uh, stateside. Certainly the CFL is an option for some players as well. Um, but all of this information that's coming out, all these partnerships that are advantageous to players, such as the one the XFL announced today, um, that's something that, you know, when you have that scale of USFL, XFL, it's something that players and agents can put on the XFL side and, and the XFL hopes it'll weigh more in their favor when these players and agents are deciding which way to go. Well, that's the other thing too. We had today, I got in a little bit of a disagreement online. USFL, uh, Aaron Wilson, right? He's like an NFL insider came out. He said, well, you know, per the league now, USFL players, if you didn't make the playoffs, cause uh, this week 10 is like the last week that the games don't really matter. And then the, the playoffs are set. They're going into playoffs you're able to pursue NFL contracts at this point, right? I mean, we're mid-June. Like, we're in mandatory OTAs at this point. Um, yeah, this is the time of year when, like, mm -hmm. uh, Kyler Murray isn't showing up and people get weird or whatever. But the XFL doing that, you know, being out in mid-April, end of April, sending players to the camps versus this mid-June now, what do you make of that in the timeline? Because all these things factor into, like, which is the better landscape of year to for the league to be in. Yeah, and I think it's more advantageous to the XFL um, because those players are going to be available right around the time that uh, the NFL draft starts. And, uh, you know, the big thing for players is they want to be in camps from the beginning. You know, they want to be there for OTAs, um, whether they're optional or mandatory. They want to be there for mini camps um, because they these are the players that really need the most time to show coaching staff. The guys on the back end of the roster, they're the ones who need the most time to show the coaching staff that they're worth keeping around. And if you plop guys down right before training camp starts, you know, like the, it's going to happen with the USFL, uh, it does, you know, they're, they're a little bit of a disadvantage, maybe not a great disadvantage because training camp hasn't really started yet. And the NFL teams can now after OTAs and mini camps, sit back and, and take a look at some of the rookie free agents that they've signed and, and the others on the back end of the roster and say, you know, is there anyone that's going to be a free agent in the USFL who we can use to replace one of those other guys who maybe didn't show out as well in OTAs or mini camps. So it's not a terrible uh, time, um, but it's sort of on the later end of what I think you'd want, what players and agents uh, would want. So I think the XFL does have an advantage there.
It's just hard. Like, you know, these guys are coming from just playing game. You know, we had the big viral clip last week. The USFL guy got hit. Like, his wisdom tooth broke off. Like, you know, I mean, you're going from this isn't I'm training. I'm getting ready to go to you know, OTAs. This is I literally was just in the football game last Sunday. And now, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there is, there is the wear and tear there that is, you know, I mean, you're also going to be in game shape. I guess that's one thing. It just depends how banged up you are. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point in terms of, you know, the end of the USFL season where you've just gone through 10 weeks, maybe 11 or 12 if you get to the championship game, you're going to go boom right into training camp, pads and everything. Um, and so that's a lot. Whereas, you know, the XFL season is going to end and you've got some unpadded practices. You've got some, you know, mini camps and OTAs, which compared to training camps are not as strenuous. So you do have some time to recover. Um and not push yourself physically as much as the players coming out of the USL USFL would have to do if they're in training camps. Uh, So we have the two showcases this weekend. So tomorrow, the first big one, Washington DC, they have their showcase. And then on Sunday, it's going to be uh, down in Florida. I did see some like Twitter chatter that there might be like a press conference or announcements. I don't know if that just has to do with like media availability in that way. I just saw a lot of like confusion there. What, what do you know heading into the weekend and the XFL showcase? Uh, You're going to the second one. Yeah, from what uh, we've been told, um, we'll have about an hour to be on the field, uh, to watch on-field drills. At the same time, there's going to be select head coaches and um, XFL front office personnel who will be available for interviews during that time period. And so, you know, you're kind of juggling both. I guess it depends on what you want to focus on. If you want to focus on the drills and and what the players are doing, uh, you can do that. If you want to focus on the interviews, you can do that. Um, If you want to do a combination of those, you can do that. So um, it's based on the information that I have, it's very limited media availability. We're not, it's not, you know, going to be an all day type thing where, um, you know, based on, the information posted on the XFL.com website. Uh, this check-in starts at seven for the players and offense goes in the morning, defense goes in the afternoon, and they end around five. And um, it doesn't look like the media is going to be viewing a, a whole lot of the, the on-field portion. I, I'm really torn with this, right? Obviously, I wasn't on the media side during the first XFL. I've always been told that it was more of a PR, let's get some action in the cities, right? Let's get some fans out. But like the number, like 18% of the players or something came from the showcases. But now I'm hearing that like, okay, the XFL were really um, wanting to dive in deep, find these diamonds in the rough. We have one in Hawaii. We have the HBCU one. You know, we really want to find these guys that have been left over. But yet really limited media, you know, we're not, not open to the public. So I'm like, like, what are we hiding now? Or are they looking at this totally differently than XFL 2020 did? Cause it seems like a totally opposite mindset doing the exact same thing that they did in 2020. And it's really opposite of what Danny Garcia has long talked about with the XFL, where she wants it to be very, you know, open and fan friendly and, and all this kind of thing. Uh, it does seem like XFL 2020 was a little more open about um, media attendance. And, you know, this is the first real opportunity. So I don't know how much we could write into that. Um, but it, they are having extensive COVID-19 testing. So media needs to have proof of vaccination and they are doing testing on site. So I think that's part of the reason they're either limiting the media or, you know, kind of closing it off to to fans is if, if that's what they want people to go through who are coming in from the outside, you can kind of understand why they'd want to limit that. Um, but yeah, I think it's a whole other conversation in terms of, and this is a question I hope to ask on Sunday is uh, the show- showcases in 2020 being uh, invitation only where these showcases are open to the public. So long as you're willing to pay uh, the price to, to come to these tryouts and meet the certain criteria that were set forth by uh, player personnel, of the XFL. So I think you did say it's kind of diamond in the rough. I think it would be a great story for the XFL to have someone come out of these showcases and star in the league. Uh, and I think that's kind of what they're doing it for. Uh, and they've long talked about wanting to provide an opportunity for those types of players. And uh, they're living up to that as far as opening these showcases up to um, to the players who might not otherwise be on a tryout list if the XFL were to send out invitations. 
Yeah, I like that. I like, uh, especially because USFL, it was like agent only. You know, you had to go through them. You know, they they really only selected certain people to go to the tryouts. I like the open tryouts, like you said, except like, well, you got to pay to be a part of this. But I mean, that's a lot of effort. You're flying everyone in. I mean, like the rocks, mm-hmm. the Hawaii one. You know, you're going to have people floating. You know, a, a lot's going into it. So I so I like that 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 you do have to pay if you're going to be a part of it. But it is you're you're opening it up to more than because not everyone you can be a good football player and not have an agent associated with you. Yeah. And, you know, again, this goes back to what they want the XFL to be about is being a place where the dreamers can go to achieve those dreams. And, you know, for for folks who've been out of football for two or three years and are still hungry and are still in shape, this is their opportunity to show out, you know, and I'm sure the league will get some great footage. They'll get some great stories out of these showcases, if nothing else. And uh, who knows, you might find a couple of players that will, make an impact in the XFL. Um, certainly by the sounds of it, uh, the league is going to pound the pavement pretty hard for the players who are cut at the end of NFL training camps who don't make practice squads. That's where I think they'd like to get uh, most of their draft pool from. But, uh, you know, you're going to have players who say, no, I'd rather take my chances and, and do the tryout circuit uh, during the NFL season and get signed when someone gets injured. And so, uh, you know, you're, you're probably not going to get all the players you want from that. So you got to supplement that for the draft pool with a lot of guys who are going to come from these tryouts. Well, especially if they're going to have, uh, I, I think it's rumored, I don't know if it's the officially announced, you know, larger rosters just in general anyway from the X, uh, from USFL, which has, the what was it, 45, and now we've expanded with the practice. I mean, XFL is, like I said, I don't know if it's official, official, or just very rumored official that they're going to be carrying larger rosters, and you just need more guys to fill that. Yeah, I think there was the the report that came out. I think it was from ESPN about the um, the the meeting that XFL personnel had with agents and somebody, you know, seventy five man regular season rosters. I was like, wait a minute, oh, that's not right. That's got to be training camp and then pare it down. So um, something got lost in translation. I think there when when they were communicating the information from the the agents probably who leaked what the info oh, what the meeting was about. So. Um, yeah, it, I mean, even if training camp rosters are that big, that's a pretty sizable training camp roster that you're going to pare down probably to a roster around the size of an NFL uh, regular season roster. Uh, yeah, it's always like, what, what do we know? What do we think we know? What do we actually, you know, it's like, we know the cities now, but we don't really know the cities. And we know right. <laughs> we use some of the coaches and now we know the coaches, but we don't know this. It's always that tricky. That's why, like, when I tell Mike or whoever, like, Mike Mitchell, you know, don't tell me anything I'm not supposed to know because I'm i still in my, yeah. I don't even know what stuff I do know what's actually real. About, so. Right. <laughs> what's been officially reported? What hasn't? I mean, it all muddies together uh, at some point. Uh, I am going to be curious though, because this is the first and, you know, we might talk just offline about this because, you know, I'm someone that covers all this. Like, this is the first, how are we dealing with the media, right? This isn't, okay, we're on ESPN or we're on Get Up or whatever. Like this is, you know, you're from XFL board going out there, covering this. Like, I'm curious to see how they interact with you guys, you know, having this limited not a lot of availability. You're driving in, right? Presumably these aren't like I would be flying to the Arizona one if we end mm-hmm. up going to that. So I'm just curious how they end up interacting with people. I was telling you before we recorded, you know, weirdness I had with the with the media distribution list and, and getting on and then getting off and getting back on because of, oh, we only have a finite number of slots per each uh, affiliate. I mean, I don't know that just maybe it's growing pains, but I'll just be, this is your first kind of exposure to all of this. And just how do they treat you guys? Do they treat you like actual journalists, which you, you know, we are. And I think we need to champion that in the alt football Mm -hmm. world. Or is it like, Oh, Hey guys, like you're also here too. Yeah, I I think you nailed it. It's the first opportunity, um, not only for us to make an impression, but really it's the first opportunity for the XFL PR people and, uh, you know, whether they've hired an outside firm to handle it, uh, to really get their arms around how to handle something like this. So, uh, you know, there's going to be growing pains. There's going to be bumps in the road. You know, uh, I, I, expect that to happen. But, you know, from an XFL media point of view, all I can do is act as professional as I can, you know, and hopefully they see that they take notice of that and they recognize that going forward. 
Yeah, because I I really mean that. Where I think we just as an alt football society need to champion our own media just as much as everyone else. You know, there's mm-hmm. this stuff's coming out with the cities now or with the teams, and it's like we, you know we've known these things for six months or four months or whatever, and then oh well, um, you know Kevin Cipher, you know, and he's been on the show, he's a friend, but like Kevin Cipher writes a story like okay, well now that's gospel. Now it's like well no, like we you know we can champion and build up our own affiliates and the own um, like I said you know, X board and even newsroom to the extent and news hub like we i just think we need to do a better job of like accepting you know the journalism that we're doing as well because i think we do just as good a job absolutely and and i think you you hit the nail on the head of the big three is kind of how i see it in in the xfl reporting world and you know there's times where i'll go to news hub or i'll go to newsroom and, and and read a story maybe it's something that i hadn't heard before that you know they they've dug on and really all three have done a really nice job of not only analyzing stuff, but really digging. I mean, there's been long stretches where we've gotten no news from the XFL and people have been able to uncover stuff and they're looking in different places. And so, uh, you know, that's what, that's what journalism is all about. It's about asking questions. It's about looking for information when we're not getting any from the, the main source. So um, I, I really respect uh, the work that, that all three groups do. And I think they've done a nice job and I, I hope they continue to hold themselves to, to a high standard because that's what it's going to take to be recognized uh, by the league as legitimate sources of analysis and information. Yeah, I just don't want, I just, I've lived through this with the USFL and, and like, we're only, you know, this preferential treatment of all this. I just, I get really tired of it. And I know it's a, the chip on my shoulder that I go with, because obviously this is what we do, but it, it's really hard when like, you know, it is, there's preferential treatment. It's like, let's, you know, let, let's spread the wealth here a little bit. I think everyone's doing valid work. And I think that, um, you know, getting scoops or giving information or whatever, I don't know. I, it, it's my chip, but I just, I hope. We'll see. And maybe the XFL will be just as bad as the Spring League was, and we'll have to basically beg to get player interviews. I guess we'll find out soon. So, yeah, I hope it doesn't come to that. <laughs> I, I had to, I'm like, can I please get Cole Boozer on? I'm like, I have Cole. This is, I would go with the Spring League people. I'm like, I am DMing Cole Boozer right now. He is in his hotel room. I'm like, can you please, can you please just hop on the Zoom call for 10 minutes? Like, well, you know, I don't really know about that. Uh, so, we and, have- and I, that's it to me, I don't understand because. Uh, a group like the Spring League, you would think that they would want to reach out to anyone who would cover them. Like, what What was the hesitation? I just don't understand it from their point of view. No. Uh, so we have the eight uh, kind of we're, we're filling out the teams here, right? We have so we, we know all the coaches. They're not. It, I, I think I said last week, it's not like. Uh, it's not, you know, the Seattle team, whatever. It's very like, much like Survivor right now, right? We have like Anthony Beck's tribe, like who's on Anthony Beck's team, you know, who's with And you? it's made things very, very strange when putting out press releases when they can't say what city these uh, these uh, guys are going to be coaching. And it's, it's very, um, it's very odd. What are you noticing on that? And, you know, just um, the way that not only when the head coaches were announced, but especially when the assistant coaches were announced and they had to say like, you know, Reggie Barlow's team is going to be, you know, it's just like, it's the phrasing. They have to really be weird about it because they don't have, you know, it's not the normal operations um, to, to, to do that. You know, usually by now, if you're hiring coaches, you have the city first and then you hire the coaches. I mean, that's the normal order of things as we've seen throughout sports history and you know now we have coaches for teams that don't exist yet and so it, it's caused the league to have to sort of um do some bending over and and odd phrasing just to send out press releases of of this news it is i will say because yeah, I obviously we you know we're having the showcases right the OCs and you know does the coordinator they're all going to be there right so that's why I like okay we got to announce this ahead of time because you know mm-hmm. you know June Jones is going to be walking around and people oh that's June Jones there you know what's he doing hanging out with Jim yeah. Haslett but like that's why this June first and they have the Randy Crack Hour St Louis thing like that's why <clears> that made so much sense to me because I'm like it's yeah. June one let's get the teams out there then we'll do this announcement here in the middle of June and then we'll do showcase cases that it just makes sense like yeah you know, we the last time we had you on i think we had the smoke going to houston and going to like la or uh, vegas mm-hmm. or whatever but like what do you make of now we're mid-june we have showcases but no actual cities announced it is strange 
And I think a lot of people are getting worried about what that means. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's time to worry yet, but it is, it is strange. I will say that, you know, um, and I don't know. I, I threw this out on the XFL board forums. I said they might be waiting till USFL championship week to release that information. I mean, we saw um, no more obvious of a I don't know if I can say it, but a cock block uh, when the, the XFL put out their news uh, the week that USFL games were starting. And, you know, that was it's always been sort of the XFL dropping news around the time that USFL news had dropped, but it was no more obvious that they were trying to uh, get out there ahead of the USFL than that. And I said, you know, it makes sense that they would want to do it uh, the, the week that USFL uh, championship week is, but I, I don't know that for a fact, it's just speculation on my part, but um, you know, if, if, the league wants to kind of spread out the news throughout the summer to stay in the consciousness of the football fan. You know, you've got these showcases a couple of weeks ago, you had the assistance announced. So it could be after that, that they decide to, to drop the cities uh, to me, you would want to, that's information that you would want to get out as soon as possible because you want to start developing a connection with the people in those cities and in, uh, in, in, you know, five of the eight cities anyway, they may have some brand loyalty built in from XFL 2020, where you have people in Houston and Dallas and uh, St. Louis who went to games in 2020. You may not have to reach too hard to um, get them to come back, but I mean, you're, you're building a brand from the ground up in places like Las Vegas and, uh, and Orlando, although Tampa Bay is right across the, the state. So you would think that you would want to start cultivating that fan base as early as possible. And the longer you wait to release the official word that these cities are a part of the XFL, then, you know, the, the shorter amount of time you have to build that base, you, the shorter amount of time you have to sell merchandise, the shorter amount of time that you have to, um, you know, reach out to people in that city and to get stories written in those cities at, at the local level. So that's my concern is, you know, you're trying to build a fan base in these cities and the longer you wait, um, the less time you have to do it before kickoff. I, I, you know, it, it, cause we go week to week here and, and, you know, sometimes I kind of lose track. I mean, we're mid June. Like if the next four weeks of my life, if they're like, Hey, we're waiting for after showcases now, like this is all we're doing. Mm -hmm. Cause they're very one-minded, right? Like black Adam trailer comes out. Like we can't do anything else or like whatever, <laughs> you know, new Terramana. Also they discontinued Zoa original and sugar free this week. I don't know if anyone else is a Zoa drinker, but that was probably the biggest travesty for me. But like if we got to go the next four or five weeks, like, I mean, you know, I can only do so much here to put together a compelling show to talk about. It really is getting to like scary levels there where, you know, if we get the, like the XFL, whatever shirts, like we saw on the, on the shop and then they took them down. Like if all we're getting is cities and then we're coming out in November or whatever and saying team names, I, 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 I'm really scared here for the next six months of our news cycle. Cause we're, I mean, we're six, like what, six and a half months out from kickoff. Yeah, I mean you can you can talk about the showcases if if there's media availability at the showcases, hopefully good questions are being asked and, and answers are being given that maybe we can talk about. Um, you know, if there's lists of of player attendance like there was in uh, 2019 for the showcases, there might be some players worth talking about or talking to from the showcases, and and that's my hope. And as a guy who, if you ever read my stuff at XFL Board, you know that I'm uh, I love the 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 personnel side of it and, and analyzing and evaluating the players and, and potential players. So I'm really hoping to, to walk into the Florida showcase and them hand me a list of, of the attendance. Uh, I, I, I don't have my hopes too high for that, but I'm hoping that's what happens. Um, just so I can kind of go back and, and sit in my bunker and do some scouting of some of these guys and, and write some stories about these guys. But um, yeah, I think, I hate to break it to you, but it wouldn't surprise me if it, it was to, after the showcases when they, they finally revealed the cities. And as you mentioned, the leak that was on uh, XFL shop had just the cities on the shirts. And, and that's what, you know, that's what XFL 2019 did. They announced the cities well ahead of the nicknames and the logos and everything like that. So uh, hopefully they, they have everything. They're just waiting for the right time to reveal. Hopefully it's not a situation where, 
they don't have things lined up, whether it's they don't have the lease agreements, whether it's they don't have, um, you know, whatever else it goes into um, agreeing to to play in a city. Uh, hopefully it's not that. Hopefully it's just, okay, we have all this stuff. We're just waiting for the right time in our minds to release the information publicly. I think something got delayed. I think there was enough smoke with this June 1st thing. I think something happened. I, I, I got messages like, you know, in was it San Antonio or like one of the leases, something was up because, you know, they did all of her luck before, like announced the cities and they hadn't signed everything. And then they had to pay more because they, you know, like, well, that's something else you can cover. The lawsuits coming up next month with uh, Vincent and Oliver Luck. So I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe the Mark cast can have an official, um, uh, you know, someone at the at the courthouse reporting live from from the courthouse. Well, you know, wait, <laughs> That's what it may come to. <laughs> your your boss Wade Keller was. You know, I was there every day in New York for the steroid show. Yep. I was there. I don't think day. he'll be there for this one. <laughs> uh, but I was going to say, and before I got sick, I was going to start off today, and I was going to say, how glad do you think that the XFL is that they're no longer involved with Vince McMahon now that he's facing? You know, where did this three million? What did what was this paying off for? This three million to yeah. a former employee. What a what a wild story the wall street journal reported yesterday that uh the board of directors of wwe which by the way includes vince's daughter and son-in-law uh is investigating this an uh, email that was sent to them accusing vince of paying off a former mistress three million dollars and now the the question is did it come from company money was it vince's own personal money you know how did that shake out so uh, it's that has the potential to be a very big story for WWE. And, and you're right. You know, I think of there was a lot of people who were unhappy that Vince was sort of blocked from uh, getting into the fray, so to speak, to to buying the XFL back out of bankruptcy, uh, blocked by the creditors, I believe, who put up an objection to that. And. You know, I, I guess this is this is probably not something you'd want to be talking about in the off season for uh, for the league owner. No, I, but for the showcases, I do think you'll need to do like you know. I used to go to a lot more wrestling events and like you hang out backstage, right? Like see who yeah. shows up in the limo, right? Like. Have your <laughs> But, you know, you might have to get there really early for the showcase and see like, mm -hmm. well, who comes walking in with the bag. I mean, are they bust? Are they not going to bust in everyone with like blacked out tarps? I mean, they're going to guys yeah. are going to be showing up. So I'll be curious because you're going to get you're going to see enough guys, even if you don't have a complete list. I mean, there's going to be notable mm -hmm. names for sure that get leaked out of these. Sure. And, and you don't know how much the XFL is going to cover it themselves. You know, um, they've been touting this pretty heavily on social media in terms of Twitter and things like that. There was just another uh, video posted today uh, with some quotes from the coaches about what they're looking for from the players at the showcase. So it's entirely possible that the XFL posts videos of the workouts, posts interviews with notable players at the workouts and, and things like that. What they and not me because I'm too I too sick and busy right now. But like hire like a, a, a second year uh, broadcast graduate right that's working in a local market somewhere. Get some MMJ. Give them a camera. Give them a mic. Have them go around interview players. Do stuff. Do mm -hmm. like. Uh, fan control football used to be really good at doing that. Even the spring league, not the last year, but when they were in the bubble in San Antonio, they had a girl that would go every day. It was like Kelly's three minutes or whatever it was. And they go around, they interview the players. And this was a spring league. It, it costs no yeah. money at all. Get some kid, you know, even if you're, it's call it an internship, pay them 40 grand, whatever, come out for this, you know, a couple months to do it. But I think you can get so many good stories in this. Like you said, I hope the XFL does a good job of covering this themselves as well as allowing the, the media to cover it. Well, if you think about what, and I go back to what Danny Garcia said, what she wants this league to be, and it's not just an on-field product that lives for three months out of the year. It's a 24-7, 365-day league, and if you want your league to be that, you need content. And this is a place where you can go to get content. This is a place you can go to tell the stories of the players that the league wants to tell based on what we've heard from the ownership. Uh, so if next January or February, there is a XFL show on ESPN Plus where it shows from the time that 
Danny Garcia bought the league through the negotiations with the CFL, through everything, there might be some videos and interviews. With we may have to wait a while. <laughs> it may not be till uh, they really start amping up for the season, but there may be some footage of this that will be used in that sort of shoulder programming for the XFL that's been talked about. Yeah, I we'll see. I, I we've been long promised this like behind the scenes hard knocks, and they, I think the Rock they released some of that stuff. It was all stylized. And, well, this has to be for the behind the scenes. Like, I don't know if people outside of the norm care. I do think United by Football with USFL did a much better job. I don't think a lot of people watch it, but did a much better job of highlighting relatable stories that people like. You know, Dorothy or my mom could watch and be like, oh, I really mm-hmm. like that guy. Where. I don't know if a lot of people like, I want to see the rock buy a football league. Like, I don't know. Maybe that is more exciting. You tell me. Yeah. I, I think for the, for the vast majority of the casual fan, maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't know what, how you tailor that. Uh, like I said, I think, I think just even little bite-sized stuff with players, getting the coaches out there, you know, they do all this, even USFL, let's sit down all the coaches where we'll do all this stuff. Just see them on the element, interview them after mm-hmm. practice, like wrestling. They always talk like, Get the guys just coming back from the ring. Talk to them when they're all worked up mm-hmm. in character. Not this forced promo out. You know, we've got it all lit and polished perfectly. Yeah, so. yeah I, I think there's some merit to what you're saying. And I think there's some some validity to you know how many people are really interested in the machinations of behind the scenes of a purchase of a league. I think it also really depends on how much the XFL is going to lean on The Rock as a personality um, within the XFL structure right so are are they going to be if they are going to do some sort of behind the scenes thing from even the coaches meeting where we saw um some snippets of that and i think that's what you were talking about released on social media uh with the rock really sitting at the head of the table and 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 doing a lot of talking so for those shows is the rock going to be a a big part of it um we've seen i think it was reported by brian alvarez over at um the wrestling observer that the rock has kind of blocked out the XFL season. He's not filming any movies. He's going to give a lot of his attention to the XFL. And you know, you think about the rock. I mean, how hands-on is he really going to be once the season starts? Like what, what day-to-day operations does he really have to do other than being the face of the league for these kind of behind the scenes shows and, and things like that. So you wonder if that's where he's going to play a big part. I would like that. Uh, before I let you go, since we kind of we're going to talk about this and then we got sidetracked, but uh, like major takeaways you had from the coordinator hires, defensive coordinator, the DPPs. I know some of the guys returned. You know, we have Jamie Elizondo coming back, the Hayes mm-hmm. brothers. Uh, you know, obviously, this stuff came out last week, but I, I know that you're going to have thoughts on people's standouts and stuff for you. Yeah, I did a column on XFL board where I kind of ranked uh, how strong I thought um, the the combination of the head coach coordinators and director of player personnel for each team was kind of gave some background on some of them and any kind of relationships that I saw that these um, folks had previously. I think it's very similar to the head coaching hires where there is a very strong mix of experience and not so experience. Um, I was really pleased about the directors of player personnel Um, XFL 2020 had put together a really strong list. And I thought this was a strong list. You know, it wasn't guys who had been low level scouts in the NFL or guys who had, you know, gotten coffee for people in front offices in the NFL. I mean, these were directors of pro personnel, directors of college scouting. I mean, they all have extensive top level scouting experience in the NFL. Some of it's quite a while ago, but it's all still very relevant to the position they're holding within the XFL today. As far as the the assistant coaches, again, it's that mix, right? It's that mix of new and old. It's that mix of experience and inexperience. I loved that Jonathan Hayes and June Jones are back. I thought they were two of the strongest coaches from XFL 2020. Um, You know, back as coordinators, would have loved to see them back as head coaches, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, Jones being back and, and obviously having led one of the strongest offenses of XFL 2020, which is a good sign. And uh, one of his protégés, AJ Smith, is going to be uh, offensive coordinator as well. So you can expect two teams with that kind of style of offense, which is going to be uh, fun to watch. And I think the other thing that stood out to me is um, not only the diversity, you know, a lot of African-American uh, presence both in in the front office and in the coordinator spot, which should not be a surprise. But also, you know, I think we looked at 
the Terrell Buckleys and the Anthony Becks and the more inexperienced coaches and who were they going to surround themselves with? Were they going to surround themselves with experienced coaches to offset their relative inexperience in the coaching world? And I think, you know, a lot of them did that. Terrell Buckley brought some guys back from, from the past. Rod Woodson, we don't really know yet. The, that's a, a blank space there, although he has Joey Klinkscales as his DPP, who's experienced at the uh, NFL. NFL level. Heinz Ward has two very experienced uh, assistants in Elizondo and Jim Herman. They were both uh, co coordinators in XFL 2020. And then you have Anthony Becht, who has probably the least coaching experience of anyone. One, uh, what, seven weeks of experience as a tight ends coach of the fleet in the AAF. And here he brings on Bruce Gradkowski, who has experience as a high school coach, and that's it, as his offensive coordinator. And uh, Donnie Abraham, former NFL player, uh, as his defensive coordinator, who has very limited coaching experience, certainly not at the coordinator level uh, at college or pros. So that's going to be really interesting to watch is, is how they are able to, to meld together. And I think the one thing I'll say that has kind of, you know, the curtains kind of opened for me is when the head coaches were first announced, you saw the, the mix and you saw, okay, yeah, obviously they wanted a mix of, of old and, and young. But the more you dug into it, and even you saw how they were presented by the XFL social media team, it was all players, you know, the, the inexperienced head coaches were all players who had played a decade in the NFL, who had been to Super Bowls, who had been to Pro Bowls, who had been in the Hall of Fame. You know, these are not just uh, three-year players who they're giving an opportunity to. These are players who, on day one, even though they don't have that coaching experience are going to command respect from their players based on the credentials they detained in the NFL. So I think that was a conscious decision by the XFL, not just to hire maybe younger coaches or coaches that did not have head coach or even coordinator experience as their head coaches, but to bring guys in who were decorated NFL players. Well, it's like, yeah, if I, it's like WWE, you know, if I haven't held the heavyweight title about yet, but you know, 16 time intercontinental champion, you know, three time European champion, you know, I got the hardcore title a couple of mm -hmm. times, like, but adding that in, I totally know what you mean. And, 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 and presenting them, you, you know, it, it's like the Paul Heyman, right? Like let, let's emphasize the strengths. Let's hide the weaknesses, right? Like let's not talk yep. about Anthony Beck, not having the most coaching. Anthony Beck tweeted that video out, like from his car. Hey, this is what I'm looking for in the showcases. I want people to man up. XFL retweets that, you know, mm -hmm. that wasn't some uh, studio spotlight thing. That was just him and his car recording that. I thought that was a great look. Like let's yep. get these guys out here yep. and position him as someone that wants respect and commands it, you know? Absolutely. He's been one of the most active coaches, head coaches on social media, and it's been great to see, you know, um, obviously he's taken this seriously. There was a um, news clip of him. I, I don't know what news station it was from, but had interviewed him about, you know, being an XFL head coach and you see him in his office, you know, already going through clips of players and things like that. So, I mean, it, it's, it's starting already, even though the showcases haven't taken place, you know, we, we've seen the, um, at least one player announced um, as being a part, being involved invited to the uh, XFL draft pool. So even though we haven't had the showcases, even though we're still in training camp mode for the NFL, there are players that the XFL has their eye on and the scouting has already begun. Yeah. I think it's good just to round out, um, you know, I, I think June Jones, Elizondo, even Bob Stoops with how much this new XFL wants to not look like the old XFL. Like, I think I'd be honored to be back as an OC at this point. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, look at, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like, well, who makes it like, okay, we like Dean Blandino. Okay. We don't like Sam Schwartzstein. Okay. We like Bob Stoops. He can be a head coach, but you know, Jim, uh, June Jones can only be an OC. Like it's weird how they delineate that, but I would just be happy to be back hey, at this point. And I did think it was interesting when they sent out the release, they did note what coaches were returning from 2020. And for a league that has not had a lot of interest, it seems, in connecting with that league, I thought it was interesting that they made a note of that on the press release. 
it, it's still the it's still the damnedest thing to me where it's like we're gonna uh, i'm buying the house and then we're repainting and knocking down everything like i don't even want it to look yeah. like the old house but it's like well then why it's very weird i uh, will see how it all goes out i still have a feeling that a lot of people are not going to be happy uh, especially when we get team names and stuff whenever that comes out if nobody's ever happy when the team names come out i mean come on I, there, there's always people complaining it, it happens professionally all the time you know whenever there's a new logo released whenever there's a new team name people People hate change, and, and that's that's what it stems from. Did you see the Eagles' new logo today that looks just like the XFL logo, but just Eagles written out? Like, it's super uh, minimalistic. Yeah, yeah, and, and just another, you know, another change. <laughs> uh, anything else before I let you go? This has been extended. I appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I, I would just say... Um, I'm going to do my best to uh, tweet out some any kind of information, any nuggets that I get from coaches and personnel at the Florida Showcase on Sunday. So you can follow me on Twitter at Greg M. Parks. Certainly, I'm going to have uh, continuing stories up on XFL board. So go there to, to follow um, whatever stories I write coming out of Sunday. And obviously, you know, the showcases start on, on Friday. And we're hopefully going to get some information. Hopefully, uh, there's some media there to interview uh, maybe coaches and, and personnel there, and maybe we'll get some answers to some questions we have there. So be on the lookout for that on Twitter as well. Yeah, you're our, you are our eyes. There's, I don't know anyone else that's going. I think Mark was going to go, and then he's in Disneyland or whatever. So Greg, like I said, yeah, follow <laughs> Greg on Twitter. You really are our eyes and ears, and I expect lots of like um, – you know, good clips, maybe some like selfies. I want to see you in the action. I want to see you in the, in the media scrum out there. I'm, my, my cell phone camera is not so good. I, I'm not an expert at taking videos and, and selfies and things like that. So hopefully words will do because that's probably going to be my best option. Uh, well, Greg, we appreciate it. We'll get you back on when you're back from vacation. I appreciate it. You said, you said, whenever I want to have you on, you're happy to come on. Yes, so this is, this I, it's, it. abso it's absolutely true. That's why I'm here today. You asked it and I answered the bell. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Greg Parks with XFL Board, now friend of the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I know that I'm in the Football Reporters of Canada now. Is there a special branch now that we've, like, I know you have also, I have now had an exclusive interview with Randy Ambrosi, commissioner of the CFL. Like, do we get our own? Is there, like, a separate now party room for that? <laughs> wow. <Well, laughs> I'm not sure how I answer that. There, there's a special initiation uh, ceremony, actually, uh, at the next Grey Cup. Uh, I won't tell you, like, I won't spoil any surprises, but, uh, yeah, come prepared for the special initiation. The special initiation. Now, we're, we got a ticking time bomb here today, Tim. I had a windows cleaner scheduled to come to the house, do our house windows. They were supposed to be here at one. They're not here yet. So at any moment, if this interview abruptly gets edited to further in time, we'll see what's going on here. Uh, how are you doing and how was the first week of CFL action for you? Um, well, it's, I, I mean, I guess it, it just was exciting because we, there was so, there's so much uncertainty. There was no season in 2020, 2021, uh, was an abbreviated, was a late training camp, no preseason games and, uh, an abbreviated schedule by, by four games. So I guess knowing that we were going into this and there'd be at least a sense of normalcy. Um, it, it was an exciting buildup and to see preseason games, to see a full training camp, to get, I mean, from a reporter's perspective, we have access to players again. It's not, we're not starting the year with Zoom calls and, and it's such an impersonal thing. Um, we have one-on-one -on -one access in, with players for, for reporters um, and, and anybody covering the team. It's so beneficial to develop that relationship one-on-one uh, -on -one with players because there's a, there's a trust factor there. and. Um, I mean, that helps us to tell our stories better. I, I thought it was a tremendous weekend of games, right? I mean, I thought the kickoff was exciting. It went down to the last second. Uh, I watched the, I, I missed the, um, uh, the uh, Red Blacks and Winnipeg game I was working. I had my phone on at the wedding I was filming, watching BC absolutely just wipe the floor with Edmonton. I mean, that truly was like the highlight of my weekend. Uh, what did you think of, of just the, the quality of play? I mean, high scoring, lots of big games, lots of big, uh, you know, big plays and everything else. Yeah, I mean, certainly the BC game. Uh, we, we talk about the CFL and... Um, three franchises with 
uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, a, a fan base that hasn't necessarily cooperated and attended games. Um, BC would be one of the concerns. And to see 34,000 people um, in the stands and it helped by a One Republic concert before the game. But when you're going to do that, when you're going to get 34,000 uh, people in the stands, you better deliver on the field. It's one thing to go have a great entertainment package. And I'm sure they had $5 beer, they had cheaper beer and they had food was probably a great price. And they had, a, they had a great concert, but if you're going to get the people there, cause a lot of those people were first timers or people who haven't gone to a game in a while, then the, the perfect scenario is you deliver like they did. What, what a tremendous, tremendous effort, uh, Canadian quarterback. And, uh, and, uh, for those of us in Canada, it's, it, it's, it's been a long time since, there's been an impact Canadian quarterback. They're all, they're Americans. And to see Nathan Rourke go in and, and have an outstanding game, um, certainly good to see. And overall, you look at the, there were a lot of good games, low scoring, Hamilton uh, and Saskatchewan, uh, a defensive battle. Ottawa, I think from the perspective of a lot of people who watched the game, Ottawa outplayed Winnipeg on both offense and defense. And at worst, it was a soft, and they probably won special teams too, and still managed to lose the game 19-17. So uh, to see the uh, Red Blacks team that won just three games a year ago go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the defending Grey Cup champions, a team I think that had won 90 of its past, uh, sorry, 90, 19 of its past 20 home games, Ottawa went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and was probably a better, better team. And, and we get a rematch of that this week uh, with Ottawa opening its home schedule. Yeah, I, I will, we'll touch down on Ottawa because obviously that's your big, you know, obviously the team that you cover primarily. But uh, thoughts on, to, to wrap up on the BC stuff, because I'm curious your thoughts. A, yeah, I was terrified I was going to turn it on and it was going to be like, you know, three to six or whatever, or, you know, BC was going to be down huge. I saw, you know, our friend Dave Daler tweet this week, like, well, this is why we need 10 teams, because here we have a big, the big excitement with BC. Immediately we go into a bye week, right? Week off, back, you know, week three. Do you, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, obviously not the 10 teams and all that, but BC being able to continue its, this momentum now that they have going. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, forget the momentum BC, it, it, it's, uh, nine is an odd number to have, and they're forced to have three bye weeks because of it. Certainly, they could get the the schedule condensed a little bit. They could maybe start a little earlier. And if the goal is to play a Grey Cup earlier, um, either end of October or early November, they could accomplish that. And um, uh, they've uh, teams that have been talked about. We've talked about Halifax. We've talked about the East Coast. And, uh, I mean, we've heard in the past, we've heard Quebec City mentioned as well. And I'm fully supportive of either location because my two favorite home city, or my two favorite visiting or cities to visit in the CFL, Montreal and Vancouver. And Quebec City and Halifax would move right up the list because they're two of my other favorite cities in Canada. So I'm fully supportive. I think we go to 11 teams and go with the odd number again just so we can get Quebec City and Halifax in the league. Yeah, it was like when Randy said in the interview, he's like, well, if we get 10, then we'll do two every time. I was like, okay, let's walk before we, or let's crawl before we walk here. Like, let's not put the car, let's get, let's get an even number of like, these. But I, seriously, though, like, do you, was it just a concert? I mean, was it just Amar Domain coming in? I mean, I saw the videos, Nick Kowalski, our friend, you know, they had, it was like parties outside, the street was packed. I mean, I saw all the video coming out of it that I could, like, uh, I wish I could have been there. I had this wedding two years booked, but uh, I mean, is there, do you feel like they've changed that or is it just a one-off? No, I, I, I think you really can change an atmosphere and a, a vibe about a team. I think it's, it's, it's different than it was 20 years ago, not only in the CFL, everywhere. It's not like you, you've got your old fan base that wants to go and just sit and watch a football game. Maybe the cheerleaders get up and, and they do a couple of routines, and that, keep, that kept everybody happy. I think it's much more than that now. I think a football stadium becomes a destination, and people want to be entertained. Obviously, they want their team football team to win, but maybe they want to sit. They don't even want to sit in their seats. They want to sit out. The, a lot of stadiums now have like guardrails, and and people are sitting are 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 mingling. I think that that really is uh, really is our younger is the is the fan base of the future, and I think you've got to keep them entertained. It, it, it's got to be fast moving. 
like football sometimes can be a little methodical. There's a play and a couple of plays, and then there's a TV timeout. I think you really have to keep things moving, and you've got to get that kind of a, a vibe inside the stadium. And by the looks of it, BC really did manage to accomplish that. And if you've got people going to a game for the first time or haven't been to a game in a long time, they had to be impressed. Like, what more could you ask for? You're being entertained, um, and and your football team put on a hell of an effort and won the game. So I think, will they have 34,000 people the next game? Probably not. But, you know, for a team that was drawing probably less than 50, between 10 and 15,000, I think if they could put fifteen to 20,000 in the, in, in the stands uh, every game, that's a big step ahead. So it will be interesting to see what happens uh, next home game for the BC Lions. Uh, is yeah, they kept showing that they have the the sweet cam. They kept showing the Mar, you know, a friend of the show now, Mar Doman. Like I just thought, man, he had to just been like grinning ear to ear because it was like. I, there was a lot of unknowns, right? And this isn't like booking wrestling. You know, we watch wrestling, and that's what killed me forever. Is I'm like, Vince McMahon, like, you can control the outcome of every match. Like, the crowd should go home happy every time, right? Like, why is Roman Reigns winning for the sixth WrestleMania, right? We can control this. Amar, you can't control 59-15. You can't control, you know, Nathan Rourke doing well or, you know, Chris Jones and Edmonton kind of struggling. Like, a lot of it had to really go you know, according to plan to kind of work out that way. So I was excited. I mean, you mentioned Chris Jones. I, I'm thinking of wrestling. Like Chris Jones would be that, that villainous manager. Like he'd be like a, a modern day Bobby, the brain Heenan, like, you know, kind of brainstorming and, uh, and, and, and being that heel behind the scenes. Yeah. He definitely, he would never be a face. Uh, he was talking to the attendants. I saw someone posted today in our CFL chatter group on uh, Facebook uh, they're talking the Argos home opener this weekend. They're giving out like 1,500 hats, right, to the first. Uh, the Blue Jays are giving out like 15,000 jerseys. And they're like, if you want to talk about like the expectations of crowds and the numbers, I just thought that was interesting. I mean, obviously Argos would kill to have 15,000 people there. But it is always funny when I like, I think they had the the alternative shirt night or whatever last year in Toronto had like, oh, we're giving out 20,000 shirts or something. I'm like, you guys are never giving out that many shirts here. Yeah, I mean it's it, it's unfortunate. I grew up an Argo fan, so I mean I always hope for for the team to have success. And I mean I grew up in an era where they played an exhibition stadium along the water, and uh, they were drawing thirty to forty thousand people. Like imagine that. That now that was pre Blue Jays, uh, pre Raptors. So the you know the entertainment dollar was not being being as spread around. But but the days are there. There are football fans there, and, and the trick is how do you get, how do you get them? I mean that's the $2 million question is how do you get the, the fans to come out to your stadium when you're when you're against the Raptors and the Leafs and the Blue Jays, Toronto FC? There's a lot of uh, competing sports franchises there. And I mean, I don't know, uh, should you be giving away uh, 10,000 jerseys if you're the Argos? Yeah, probably 10, whatever, 1,500 hats. That's a lot. Like, just, just go to the games. It's a great experience. It's a great stadium. As like, like USFL does that right now, right? Because they, you, I'm sure you've heard the whole Birmingham and there's no fans. Yeah, they're like giving that beach towels and stuff. I'm like, I would just save that money. Like at this point, like I don't think you're getting one extra person because of the beach towel. Like everyone that's going is getting a great. They're like, oh, this is awesome. But I don't think you're attracting one more fan because they're like, oh, I got to get my USFL beach towel today. Imagine if they gave up free beer. What a what a crap show that would be. <laughs> uh, so I want to talk about your new big quarterback, right, Jeremiah Mazzoli. Uh, even in a loss, great game, right? A 380 yards, you know, one TD, one interception. But do you think there was a lot of Hamilton Tie Cat fans that watched Dan Evans kind of struggle for the Tie Cats, and they're like, "Well, we could could have had Mazzoli instead." Yeah, maybe. I mean, that was probably a, a, a tough decision for the Tie Cats to make. I think. Uh, you know, maybe they look both guys uh, almost equal ground. Jeremiah Masoli, obviously the guy with the longer track record, the guy that almost led them to a Grey Cup win last year. Um, and Dane Evans, the guy they saw so much promise from. I mean, I, I watched the Hamilton game and uh, it, they just couldn't protect up front. And that was a big problem for the Red Blacks of a year ago. And the thing that they successfully did against Winnipeg is they protected Jeremiah Masoli. If you give your quarterback time in the CFL with the waggle and, and, and the, the, the wide field, your receivers are going to get open. But you need it, it just starts with what's up front. And if your offensive line can uh, – Red Blacks give up the most sacks in the league last year. If, if your offensive line can protect your quarterback, 
you know, almost, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter who it is, but Jeremiah Masoli had some time to throw the ball and, and he was right on top of his game. So were there Hamilton fans second guessing and saying, why, you know, why do we keep Dane and not Jeremiah? You know, I'm not sure even Jeremiah uh, would have had a great amount of success given uh, kind of the onslaught that, that Dane Evans was facing. Uh, you said at the top, you thought that, you know, went up against the league best Winnipeg, right? Held their own, even in loss. Uh, do you think there's a lot there? You see a lot of promise here that they can continue to build on. I mean, obviously a low four coming off of last year, but none, nonetheless. I do see promise. Um, and it, I think maybe they caught the bomber bombers. I don't think played their best game. So you could say, well, Winnipeg didn't play very well. Ottawa played well and still didn't win. And, and you're probably right. So I, I would expect to see Winnipeg uh, getting Jackson Jeffcoat, who's a difference maker at defensive end back this week. Uh, Zach Caleros, who had his bell rung last week, um, will play again this week, it looks like. so. Um, but again, it, it takes... We saw a lot of good things out of the Ottawa team that we didn't see a year ago. It, and it started with Jeremiah Masoli. Quarterback play last year was was not good. But again, it starts with your offensive line. If you can't protect your quarterback, if you can't create the running game, then you're in trouble. And and receiving core as well. You saw that Jeremiah spread the ball around um, um, 370 or 80 yards passing, whatever it was. Uh, a, a really, really good effort on offense. And again, I, I think their defense played really well. Really, really shut down kind of the calling card of the Blue Bombers, which is the running game. Ottawa took that away from them. Um, and if they can take the running game away, force them to pass the ball. It's not it, it's not their strength. They would rather uh, run the ball right down your throat. So if you take that uh, run if you take that run game away from them and force them to go to the air, I think you've got a chance. And uh, maybe they're one and one after this week. I thought a lot was made. I saw a lot was made that uh, Claros right got banged up. Cody Fajardo did as well. Like they they didn't pull Cody or they didn't do all. They said maybe that was a miss. Like uh, thoughts on that and kind of protecting the here. You know, such a quarterback. I mean, football in general, quarterback driven, but especially the CFL. Yeah, they've got spotters, and uh, I mean, it's a pretty ballsy decision to pull Zach Claros from the game. When I mean they're on their they're on their final drive, you know, driving to win the football game, and a spotter sees him, whatever the sign was, whether he took a step the wrong way or or whatever it was that they saw, pulled him. And in retrospect, I think they probably wish they had pulled Cody Fajardo as well. Um, I, I mean, I'm all for protecting quarterbacks. We know about head, head injuries. We know about long term impact, and uh, it's better to be safe than to be sorry in, in situations like that. Uh, how do you think uh, the Rough Riders did? I mean, obviously, you know, beat Hamilton, but uh, they were predicted like right number two in the West. I saw a lot. I mean, Winnipeg and then them. Do you think they came out firing? Yeah, I think that. I mean, that game was really a battle of defenses. Uh, both defenses were so good, and then, and then Saskatchewan got the offense going a little bit late. But uh, it's going to be. It's going to. I think it's going to be interesting in both divisions. I think. Um, I mean, Edmonton's got a long Edmonton, Edmonton better play a heck of a lot better than it did, or or they're going to again be the worst football team in the CFL. And I guess the only good thing about that is you get the number one draft pick um, if you're really bad. But but Saskatchewan is a good football team. But but then again, so is Calgary and and BC. If you look at Week One, BC's got to be much improved. They've got a great receiving core. Um, yeah, I, again, I was really impressed with the quarterback. So uh, some interesting things. And in the East, it, it, I think it's totally up in the air. A big blow to Montreal, losing William Stanback, you know, arguably the, maybe not even arguably, the best running back in the CFL right now is obviously a big blow to them. But if Ottawa can go toe-to-toe with, with the top teams, they got a bye week next week, and then they get uh, then they get BC and then Regina. So we'll see how they come out of that. And we could have uh, some some interesting races one right right maybe not one through five in the west and one through four in the east but there should be some good good divisional races this year i would expect talking about bc stuff go back to that i'm in bc Lions season today i did post on my twitter this week i said you know did the week one performance 
is that enough to sway? Like, are we in on, because they were ranked, you know, them and Edmonton, four or five in the West. Uh, 70%, I mean, I know I'm probably BC Lions heavy Twitter account, but 70% of people said that they now feel, you know, much better, significantly better, right? All in on the BC Lions this season. Uh, was that enough in week one or is it Edmonton just that bad? I, I wouldn't have guessed when it, or Edmonton was that bad. I wouldn't have last year either. And they did turn out to be, um, I mean, on, it, what we see on paper, uh, sometimes it, it, it doesn't bear out over the course of a season. Um, I, I mean, I, ha- I was sitting beside, I, uh, no names, but, uh, but an acquaintance looked at the Edmonton roster and basically was just shrugged the shoulders. It was like, uh, so I don't think, I'm not sure the expectations from the outside of the Edmonton Elks are that high right now. And the BC Lions, hey, we're one game in. We got 17 to go. It, it's a long season and uh, you can't you can't dwell on any one game. You've got to focus on the next one. And and uh, you got to win an awful lot of football games. One's not going to cut it. It's weird though. So, cause it's like only been positive out of Edmonton, but is that like, is Victor Qui is he just like smoke screening that this is still kind of the same bad team as last year with a new coach? I, maybe it's not a bad team. I they, they weren't very good in week one. Victor Qui has done a lot of great things. I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, um, a, a positive, positive addition to, to the CFL. Um, but I don't know that he's necessarily a football guy either. I'm not sure that that if, if he's evaluating his team as being, you know, we're going to be really good. Uh, well, let's let's wait and see. Um, Chris Jones, you got to think that. Uh, I mean, he's had success really wherever he's gone. So maybe we better give Chris Jones some time, and uh, maybe the Elks aren't as bad as they as they showed in Week One. But it's like that. I was talking the Mar Doman thing, right? You can't. I can only promote the team that I have, right? Like Amar can only sell out. I mean, he can't, he's not making the roster moves there. It's the same with Victor, right? Like I can, I can only publicize, you know, he's out there painting the field. I mean, there's a lot of good things there that to, to build that goodwill. But yeah, if the team is still a stinker, it's interesting that like, you know, we basically have two of the most forefront thinking kind of team owners or figureheads right now. And it's like, I got the hand I've dealt. It's like with me, with my video company, I I can only make myself so good of a videographer. I can promote, right. Or like podcasting. I can only be as good as I am. I have to, you know, we all have limitations in the world. And uh, again, I guess that's why we play the games. I mean, it's easy to look at week one and say, this team is really good or that team is really bad. It's one of 18. And there are so many circumstances and events that happen in football, injuries, uh, a guy gets cold, uh, a guy loses his job. So many things can happen. It's just tough to evaluate. It's tough to say the Edmonton Elks are the worst team in the CFL and all of a sudden the BC Lions are the best team because they beat them by 30 points or 40 points or whatever it was. Um, points. <laughs> let's wait. It was a lot of points. I'm not sure I can count that high. You, you really, you don't often see butt whoopings. I was going to use another word, but you don't really see that uh, happen too often. Uh, we, we see high scoring games. Don't often see a team lose by 40 points. Uh, a couple more. I'll let you get out of here. I appreciate your time. Um, the opener, you know, don't tell Danny Austin, but uh, Bo Levi Mitchell did not play great, right? In the home opener, struggled a little bit. Vernon Adams, friend of the show, also struggled. Like, even with Bo, Alouettes, you know, like barely lost. I mean, you know, close game at the end. What team surprised you more with that moving forward? Because we always talk about Calgary being good, but they didn't look great. Yeah, I, I'm afraid of whatever I say, Danny, my, Danny might shed a tear. He's a very sensitive fellow, you know, um, very social media sensitive. I mean, I don't know. Um, again, it's just it's just really early to sort of talk about surprises or disappointments or um, success stories. It's it's just so early. So I hate to, I hate to I'll just shrug my shoulders and I don't know. Is that, a, is that a good answer? I don't know. 
But no, but I mean, you know, a lot's been made in the off season, and you know, Bo had the broken foot or yeah. broken ankle, whatever. Right. Danny has all this. You know, Danny is pulling out the schematics of like the doctor's printouts. But you know, Bo had that and the shoulder injury, all that. Here he comes back. He gets a Charlie horse. He's in the walking boot. Now he's out. You know, we have Jake Mayer waiting in the wings that yeah. played really, really well. I just, at what point is it like? We, I mean, I get that Bo's the star and he's got all right. the tattoos and he's cool, and but I, I don't know. I mean, I just. Are, are we trying to force Bo Levi to be something that maybe he's, he's dumb? Well, I mean, the, the legacy, uh, the legacy that Bo has, I mean, I guess we have to give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, but he's got a, uh, I mean, competition is good. He's got a, he's got another quarterback nipping at his heels, another quarterback who may soon, who may be a star in the CFL one day soon. Um, it's good to have that backup. And I think Bo's got to be feeling a little bit of heat. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, job security wise, they're going to give him the benefit of the doubt because of what he's done in the CFL. But it's good to have a plan B. Yeah, hey, I'm going to end it with that. I'm just going to say it's good to have a plan B. Now, if Danny Austin is crying because, well, plan B might happen, then what can I say? I mean, it's almost like, like our Danny and Bo, but Danny's always so weird because he's like, I don't, I'm not a fan of these teams. Cause when Calgary, like when the Kraken drafted and like, we took one of the Calgary guys and I was like, you know, welfare check on Danny Austin. He's like, well, I'm not really a fan of these teams. Like I just cover them. But yet he like loves Bo Levi Mitchell. It's very weird. It's a disconnect there. I don't, you, you need to pick one side or the other. Danny is the biggest fan among amongst anybody who covers the CFL. There's fanboy, Danny the fanboy. Um, no, no, Danny's a great reporter, but I think he's he's close to the situation, and there's empathy, I think, for for and and certainly uh, an appreciation for the players on my team. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, well, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, moving forward, any final thoughts, right? This will air after, you know, Montreal says they're going to kill Toronto. I mean, that seems kind of violent, but moving into the season after the Thursday game, any other big thoughts, storylines that you're tracking on your reporter's notepad? Um, reporter's notepad is so passe. Like, like, it's like, it's like, you know, we record things and I don't know. You're um, the one that couldn't log into the Zoom. So I'm just kind of <laughs> the funny thing about reporters' notepad is, as I've gotten older, I can I can understand my writing even less. So if I have to rely totally on the notepad, it's like I have no idea what I just wrote. It's like a like a doctor, um, except at least the doctor knows what the short forms. I look at my notes. It's like, oh no, I have no idea what that says. But. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm losing it. That's good. Um, it's looking late ahead. in the day for you. This is like close to Tim's happy hour. You're recording late in the day. I appreciate I'm, it. it well, I'm getting old. It's now almost nap time. I, I finished my writing and maybe go for a sleep, you know, maybe dinner and then a nap or nap and then dinner. It, well, I mean, looking ahead, it'll be, I think it'll be interesting to see this weekend how the, the team that has been to the past two great cups uh, rebounds, because I think, Probably the Ticats feel that they didn't play their certainly their best game. I think the defense really kept them in the game. But offensively, as you said, Dane Evans was under siege um, most of the game. So I think it'll be interesting to see how they rebound uh, Calgary. I think it's Calgary, right, this week? Um, it'll be interesting to see how they rebound. Um, adversity. You face adversity, and if you're going to be a good football team, you better you better tackle adversity uh, head on. It's not something you want to let linger. So it'll be interesting to see. I think we know their defense is good. They've got a lot of uh, of all-star players on the defensive side of the ball. It'll be interesting to see if they can uh, get some offensive spark. That, I, I think that's kind of the storyline. And I think the Ottawa thing still is because you've got the uh, defending back-to-back -back defending Grey Cup champions coming in and a team that you, you dominated a week ago and, and fell short. So what do you do differently that uh, gets you on the winning side uh, in front of your uh, home crowd. Uh, last question for me. I'll let you guys see that my window washer is circling outside here. <laughs> uh, I don't, I mean, I, I'm a fan of hyperbole, so we'll go with it. Edmonton is, this is a must win game for Edmonton this weekend. Start, you can't start 0-2 losing at home. Saskatchewan did look really good last week. I mean, this is, uh, that's probably the, to me, that's the game I'm going to be watching the closest this weekend. Yeah, and I, but I don't like Edmonton's chances. I mean, you, you say you can't start 0-2, but it is an 18-game schedule. So you really, you can. You've got to figure out if you're going to lose. How do you, how do you 
<laughs> they're not going into the game to lose. But if you do, you've got to establish some kind of momentum. You can't go out and get smoked by 40 points again. You've got to figure some things out. I got to think they'll come out with a lot better effort. Um, I, I think the riders are pretty good. It's, it's going to be a really, really tough test for the Elks. And uh, I don't know, maybe they look at it as a measuring stick. Maybe they, maybe they find a way to get redemption and, and, and to bounce back from what was really a, a smelly, stinky effort last week. So we'll see. Uh, you're right. That's another interesting game. Uh, well, Tim Baines, I really appreciate it. We'll probably, we have to, you know, 21 week season, we have to get you on again before the end of this season. But regardless, I'll see you in Regina. I, I did buy Grey Cup tickets just in case there's any shenanigans with media stuff this year. So we have our Airbnb, we have our Grey Cup tickets. I'll, I'll sell those or give those away or whatever if we get our media stuff. But like, I got a long way to travel. I like to know that I'm covered. Well, and just remember, Football Reporters of Canada initiation rights, you know. The secret one. The, the, inside the, one. the secret. Yeah, the secret one. But my, I, I say no more. All right. Tim Baines, friend of the show. Thank you so much again. Take care. Thank you. Well, this is my last interview of the day, but it is honestly the one I'm most excited for. We have Keon Hatcher here of America's CFL team, as I call them, the BC Lions. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing good, man. How are you? I'm good. So I, I, Matt Baker moved worlds to get you on the show this week. I really appreciate it. You're on vacation. Well, on the bye week in Houston here, you're on vacation with your family. Uh, how's, how's your week going so far? Well, my week's been great. Um, you know, got that first game out of the way. Um, kind of good to get this, you know, second, second week bye week, just to get back to the family and see them before things actually really get going. So it's been really good. So I would have been in BC for the kickoff. We've had everyone from your organization on. We had Lamar Doman on a few weeks ago leading up to the season. Uh, I had to work. I'm a wedding videographer, and I had a wedding that had been rescheduled okay. from, <laughs> from two years ago, so I could not make it. What was it like in the 59-15 to 15, uh, victory that you guys had over the Edmonton Elks? It was um, it was exciting, man. It was a very exciting game. It was an exciting night, you know. Um, first first game of the season. Then you have you know um, the big old concert with One Republic before the before the game, and you know the, the crowd came out and they they had an electrifying out there, man. It was a really good night. It was fun, and um, it's one to remember for sure. Yeah, what was it like playing in front of? I mean, the biggest crowd BC Place has had for quite a long time thirty four thousand and change uh, fans there. It was it was huge, man. Like I said, the first this is the first time I've seen the stadium like that since I've been here, and um, I expect that you know I expect more of this season just because you know how we came out and put on the show. So I expect them to come out and you know watch us more for sure. So, you know, we've been talking to everyone off season and a lot of excitement for Nathan Rourke, a lot of excitement for you guys, all the receivers, you know, where Andrew Pearson's been on the show, O line guy. I don't know if anyone expected it to be such like just a blowout, a really dominating win. I mean, did you guys? What did you think when you look up at the scoreboard? Like we're up like six touchdowns right now. Um, to be honest, I don't think it really surprised us just because of the work we put in, man. Um, camp camp was heavy for us mentally. You know, um, we put a lot of things in, and everyone took it strong. You know what I mean? They came in, they were locked in, and you know was ready to get to work. So I don't think it really surprised us, but. It, it being a professional game, you know, you look at the scoreboard, you're like, man, we, we really did that, didn't we? So it was very exciting. Uh, I've heard a lot of, you know, now we're going into the bye, coming back. You think that that's good? Get the first win under your belt, you know, take a week, go back to your family, and then you're kind of in for the long haul. How are you looking at here approaching week three and beyond? Uh, week three and beyond, man, just got to stay locked in. You know, this, this downtime, like I said, with me, just out here being with my family is really good for me, you know. Just to get that out of the way, so I, you know, what I'm saying I get to see them, make sure everything is good with them, and now it's time to get back to work, man. And I think we got like probably like a five game stretch, so just got to lock in and you know get ready for it. Uh, who were you most impressed by? I mean, you had a great game. I mean, a lot of people had a great game. Who were you most impressed by of any of your teammates uh, first week out? Um, I was most impressed by the young guy, the young of uh, 47. Um, I can't think of his name. He is is C Cioni. Cioni, yes, yeah, Cioni. That boy had three sacks in his first his first coming out. So I was very excited for the young bull. Um, you know, and the whole team really, man. I feel like we got pieces in every position that's gonna help put this puzzle together. You know, and help us go on a run for what we want to do. So it's very right. exciting. 
Yeah, I mean, you got you know, Butler ran in a bunch. You had the defense was locked down, right? I, Trey Ford had like two or three interceptions. I was trying to film and watch the game. I was probably not doing the best <laughs> job as a yeah. but uh, it just was crazy. Like it was both sides of the ball because I had heard all off you know, BC Lions they can't run the ball. The O line stinks. Defense we're getting there, right? I mean, I thought Ryan Phillips really had you guys you know locked down on that side of the ball as well. I mean. I guess speak to just the coaches and, and getting you guys prepared for the season. Man, they, they've done a great job. Like I said, uh, camp was hard on us, you know. Um, from a mental standpoint, for the most part, you know, they threw a lot of things at us. But like I said, I feel like as a team, you know, we're, we're, we're very locked in um, on the on the scheme of things and how coach wants things to be done. So just staying locked in, man, staying true to, you know, the, um, the process and, I feel like everything else is going to take care of itself because, like, like I said, we have the puzzle. We have the pieces of the puzzle, you know, so we just got to put it together. Uh, what did you make of, you know, obviously he had played last season, but Nathan Rourke, you know, coming out, really excelling. You know, there have been a lot of questions, right? We have a young Canadian quarterback. Obviously, he played for when Michael Riley was out last season. How do you think he did? I think uh, Nate did amazing. Um, I feel like our whole team and anybody who knows Nate, knew what, you know, he's going to go out there and do and knows what he's going to go out there and do just the type of person he is, you know. Um, during camp, you hear about him, his TV's not on the, um, not on his shelf. You know, he has it turned off on the ground facing the wall. That's just how locked in he is uh, mentally, you know, and prepared for this season. So I feel like anybody who knows Nate, anybody who's been around Nate, you know, isn't surprised at the production he's put on the field and what he's going to do in the future. So, that's the type of person he is. Have you heard from anyone else from any of the other teams following this? I mean, I know you've been on the bye with your family, so maybe not, but have you heard from any of the other guys? Yeah, I heard from a few guys. I heard from a few guys. Um, let's just say let's let's just say they they are excited. They are excited to see us in person. So um yeah, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. I think it's gonna be a great year um for everyone. And yeah, we can't wait to get it started. It's just, it feels really good. I just think BC has been slept on the whole offseason. They had us fourth or fifth in the West, you know, with Edmonton. And like, what are we doing here? This is the team I've attached, you know, my whole personality to now is that we're the BC yeah. Lions team. <laughs> and it really felt good. It felt like some critics really had to kind of eat a little bit of crow over the weekend. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I seen at the beginning, of the, before the first game, I think they had us like eight, eight out of nine, you know, um, but, but that's okay. You know what I'm saying? It's not where you start, it's where you finish and we're not done yet. So we got a lot of work to do. Do you pay attention? Cause some guys say, I don't pay attention to that at all. Do you pay attention to any of that where the pundits put you? Uh, yeah, I definitely do. I definitely do. I can't say I don't because, you know, I got to see where their mind is at and we need to change that. So like I said, it's a lot of work to be done and I'm sure we'll get that done as well. Uh, so you guys are hosting again, you know, next week, Toronto, they're playing, they're kicking off like literally right now as we're talking about this. Toronto's made a lot of moves in the off season. Are you, are you excited to face them? Uh, if, excited to host? What do you think about with the week three matchup? I'm excited. Um, like you said, their game's kicking off now. So as soon as we get off here, I'm about to go turn it on, you know, get a little film study, see what they got going. Um, but yeah, I'm excited, man. I'm excited to bring them into town and, you know, do what we do. Get down. Uh, was it the atmosphere? And obviously, you guys are getting ready for the game, but you know the atmosphere and the videos I saw from Nick Kowalski. You know, your guys' this whole team, people hanging out outside. You know, it's like the the party on the street. Everyone inside. What was just that atmosphere like? It kind of anything like you had seen there before, right? Yeah, like I said, it was the first time um, I've seen BC Place look like that. Um, the atmosphere was crazy. The fans were crazy. It was loud. It was wild, man. Like I said, just just the way we came out and um, executed that first game, you know, I expect us to have a lot of more packed out games like that. And hopefully so, uh, you know, they come and show their support and, you know, we keep continuing to give them a show like that. Uh, what else are you doing this week? You're on the bye, hanging out with your family in Houston. What are you going to be spending your time with besides obviously scouting the Argonauts? Um, taking my daughter to the pool, you know, uh, having some fun with her and my lady. Um and just, you know, training, staying, staying ready, staying ready for this next week coming up. So, yeah, I'm excited, man. It's going to be a great year. Uh, well, I really appreciate it. I'll let you get back to your vacay, your bye week. But, yeah, don't don't slack on the film studies. We can't rest. We got to keep this momentum going here in the week three. You feel <laughs> confident? Definitely. You feel Most confident? <laughs> we locked in. We're locked in. 
Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, best of luck next week. We'll be watching for sure. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, I'm still a little raspy here from my Slipknot concert the other night, I think. But we are joined here today by Paul Reese, USFL historian and R Sports Central. How are you doing, Paul? I'm well. How about you, Reed? I'm good. So we wanted to get Paul back on. I was telling Dorothy. Dorothy goes, oh, you're bringing Paul back? I go, well, yeah. I said, I want to talk with him here again near the end of the season now. And then we'll probably do kind of a post-mortem of USFL Season 1. Uh, so we're, we're back at Legion Field this weekend. We're Week 10. I have a lot of stories today I want to talk about a second hub potential, RJ Young's power rankings this week from Fox. But what's kind of your main takeaway now as we are ostensibly have wrapped up the regular season here of USFL play? I think the main takeaway, particularly after the midseason meltdowns of the Alliance of American Football and XFL 2.0, is that we're at the final week. Uh, we look like we're going to make it to the finish line barring something very weird in the next couple of days. Uh, so uh, finishing the first season is the main takeaway uh, here. Um, this has been uh, in some ways a strange season. Uh, it's been odd from the very beginning to see uh, the emphasis that Fox has put on this effort and yet how they've treated it in some ways. Uh, and so I'm still at the end of the season, I'm still perplexed to a degree about what their strategy is. Yeah, it really seems like we've held, you know, held tight here, kind of ran the course. I think that's fine. I still don't, I've seen a lot of, you know, and we get into the debates online because obviously like ratings came out again this week. I still don't get how cost saving this year or next year, because I've heard, okay, well, XFL, that's a way heavier business model, right? You're going to, you're bringing in all these DPPs and we're going to be, you know, flying to the cities, whatever we're going to do it. And like, we're saving all this money. Now you're still going to have those same costs, whether it's year two. And I, we have the Daryl Johnston talking about the second hub here coming up, but like, Cost cutting now, you're at some point you're still going to have to rip that band aid off, and I just don't understand like what the what the dilemma is here. Right, and in the interim, I think that you're coloring your product in that three out of the four games every weekend are played in front of zero people. So if the curious fan tunes in, that's what they're seeing most of the time is uh, complete lack of crowd and something that ends up looking a little bit more like a scrimmage sometimes. So it, that's the impression that they take away uh, of your league, uh, whether it be in year one, you know, how long does that impression last if you go to individual cities? Uh, I, and I'm not sure how much a, a second hub alleviates that. You still have two out of your four games that are going to be uh, looking, you know, uh, being played in front of empty stands and looking like scrimmages. No, it is the thing. It, is, it, it does color it. Like you said, I think that's the right word for it because it, it just adds this perception in there. It's weird. Like, I just don't. And, and I, the, the attendance thing, hammering it down. I mean, when they were at Legion last time, there was a lot of that as well. But I just don't. It doesn't feel like a, a sexy product right now. We just had Jay Noakes. We were talking in the new sub chat. You know, you have RJ Young with 87,000 followers, whatever. He's tweeting about his interview. At, you know, it's got like 14 likes on it. I mean, it just doesn't feel like this is a hot product that, that people are really interested in. And it's weird because I I would have just thought here we're, we're approaching playoffs. You know, we have the, the one week of playoffs week after next and then the championship. It just doesn't feel, I don't know, it's weird. And even uh, as far back as following the original USFL, you almost have to flip your thinking because as the NFL reaches the end of its season and, and heads toward the playoffs, there's this huge peak of interest. With the secondary leagues, we have to keep in mind the season that they're playing in, that the weather is improving all across the country, that there are more draws on time over the weekends. So you almost have to get used to this idea uh, that the interest is going to decline to a degree, even though even when you're heading into, uh, you know, the, the ultimate part of your season. Uh, I, so that I, I haven't been uh, maybe as surprised by that. Uh, as much as I have been uh, watching the ratings, you know, I don't think that the ratings are are, are where they need to be at this point. Uh, 
I also had tweets yesterday. Uh, it, it's getting too hot in Birmingham, right? Like, because we debated and, and we, and I guess I admitted on here I was wrong. I thought the April timeline was better. I thought, you know, escape kind of that, the post Super Bowl, more of them kind of with March Madness, get out of that. Here, you know, Stanley Cup playoffs really hurt. We had the NBA finals really hurt. And now uh, I've even heard, well, it's too hot in Birmingham now. Like, I, I'm not going to go to a game in Birmingham. Like, it's too hot. It's, it's the CFL thing of it where I hear every excuse in the rule book about people on vacation. The farmers are planting seeds. We don't, the, the kids aren't out of school yet. The kids are out of school now. So now we don't like, there's all these, but now I've heard, well, we need to move the season forward because it, it's too hot in Birmingham. And in the XFL, you're already going to overlap, like how, depending on how they stagger the calendar, but like the last two weeks are already going to overlay. So if we move, let's say we do an April 1st USFL kickoff, well, then you're probably going to have a month's worth of games played you know they are going to be competing then at least for a couple of weeks depending on how you do it and the, i mean the main thing is you know tv uh if you're scheduling those games at the same time you're going to be in direct competition uh not so much for for in-person fans but uh television fans and you know how many games can you watch over the course of a weekend even when they're not in direct competition uh you know uh, i do want to you know, make one mention to the Birmingham fans and, and just kind of um, put a focus on what they've been asked to do here. Uh, not only have they been asked to go to all these games in which they don't have a dog in the fight. There isn't a Birmingham team involved three out of the four games every weekend, but they've been asked to go to 10 straight home games. What, when does that ever happen? And, and as you mentioned with, with the weather, I can see families just not wanting to do that every weekend. So it is a lot to ask. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, anybody who criticizes the fans in Birmingham, I, I have to stick up for those people a little bit because this is they've been asked to do a lot this season. Uh, I have a quote here, and this was, I'm going to share the computer audio. Here. This was Daryl Johnston. You know, he's the, what's he now, the EVP of <clears throat> football operations or whatever for the U.S. Valve. He's talking on the Next Round Live podcast, which must be a Fox property because that's the only thing that they love to talk about. Uh, but I'm going to play this. This is about a minute, and I want to get your thoughts because this is about I expanding. You know, Now, okay, we get through season one. We pop champagne like Mike Mitchell said they're going to do. And then uh, what do we do from here? And hopefully this will all play good. Um, next year, though, looking to next season, is there any tweaks you guys can maybe make to make it even a little bit better? I think the big thing is is what we've seen here in, in Birmingham um, and, and the other seven teams have, uh, have voiced their concerns about Birmingham never having an away game, even when they're slated <laughs> as the away team. Um, you know, it just doesn't happen that way. Uh, we've had tremendous support from the people here in the city of Birmingham with the Birmingham Stallions. So we'd love to see that opportunity for one of our other teams. And, and we have been in conversation uh, about some potential models where that could be the case. Um, and, and we just love to bring the excitement that the city of Birmingham has shared this year during our first season uh, with potentially another market. So, um, you know, we have some conversations uh, behind the scenes going on right now trying to figure out the best way to accomplish that. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in the future, we'll be able to, to give you some more details there. But uh, it, it's been such a success for that franchise. And, and it has been challenging for the other teams, uh, you know, to play in that environment, even when they're designated as the home team. Uh, thoughts on that? Uh, uh, much ado about very little. Um, my the two words that uh, that occurred to me were too little. Um, just establishing another hub city uh, is to me it's too little. Uh, I think that they these teams need to be in their home markets to put the best foot of the product forward. Uh, if you're not in front of home fans every week, uh, every game you're not putting the best foot, the best face of your product forward. And uh, to me, I think that that has hurt the optics on this, that when you tune into a game and see empty stands, part of you believes nobody cares. Uh, I think it's terrifying. And I said the same thing, uh, what was it, last week or whenever I had Mike Mitchell on a week or two ago where, uh, you know, the XFL, okay, we were going to have the June 1st announcement. That never happened. And like, are we still, we're like, we're still trying to figure out what cities we're in. We've had all this time. And, it, you know, is San Antonio going? Did that fall through? Well, now we have Fox. 
we've been told from day one, you know, why did they pick these eight cities? Well, they picked these eight cities because A, that was the trademarks they had. Also, they have um, potential buyers lined up in all of these markets. And that's why we've picked, you know, why are we in Houston and why are we in New Orleans or whatever? Well, now here, Daryl saying like, well, we're in talks. We're trying to figure out another city. We want to do a hub. And I'm like, I thought that was the whole point of you guys picking these cities is you, like we, we had people lined up. We had at least ideas of what we wanted to do and not, well, we're, we're trying to figure it out. And I have a hub. I'll throw your way, but uh, thoughts on that? Like, we're still like, what have we done the last nine months? You know, I and um, I don't know if they were looking for buyers for interested parties to come forward, but obviously that hasn't occurred to any great degree, you know, over this season. And uh, I, I would have said that that was likely unrealistic anyway. Um, so that's not surprising. Um, I do really uh, wonder about the logistics of a second hub city. What do you do? You have four teams uh, likely based there. Do you do round robin for three weeks or six weeks and then intermix? And then you still have travel involved. So how much are you really saving versus putting teams in, in eight different markets? Um, maybe it's significant. I also think that, uh, you know, any thoughts of, the Birmingham Stallions having kind of home field advantage is overplayed a little bit other than having a crowd behind you. Everybody's living, working, sleeping in the same city. So there's no travel involved. It's not like any of these guys have jet lag because they have to keep going to Birmingham. They're there. They, they have to walk across the street. So uh, I, uh, that's kind of an overplayed thing. That's not really a reason to change anything. The economics and the optics are a reason to change things. I just, I, I don't know if, you know, seemingly XFL is, is discovering, right, okay, if we have the people fly out, we do it that way, that is more cost effective, right, than, than having the people in the eight, you know, maybe two hubs and then having to transit between them. If you're saying, you know, if we're, if we're pay, like Fox, we're penny pinching here, Redbird, right? We've heard Redbird the same way. They don't want to spend a lot of money to lose money. I, maybe they, you know, maybe that 10% cost savings is worth it to do the two hubs. I, I don't know. And I just continue to look at how it affects the product. And the entire USFL product is the television product. It is owned by a television network. This is a television product. And how empty stands affect that product and uh, to me it just doesn't make any sense so the, the hub that i want to talk about and uh, we've been batting this around online I, I understand it would be two southern cities right so then maybe we get the like okay the south too much home field advantage in the south but spring league you know we don't like to talk about the spring league but it, it feels a little spring league here we're going to two hubs now um Houston, do Rice Stadium. That's where they did the Spring League before. I don't, I mean, it's a big cavern. I think it's cheap to use there. Brian Wood set up camp there. They did the whole thing there. What if you did a hub in Houston and then you have the hub in Birmingham? Transit between them, I think, is easier. And, and you, and you spring it that way and you say, we're going to set up four, you know, divisions be damned, but at least we have 14, you know, two of eight right. teams in their cities. Right, right. And something like that might make a lot of sense. You know, I think that it does make some sense to keep it fairly close. Uh, you either want a dome or another warm weather city. Um, so, you know, uh, it looks like the XFL may have San Antonio booked up. Uh, so, you know, something like that may make a little bit of sense to Fox. I, I still, in the end, uh, think that it's a flawed strategy. Uh, I want to get your thoughts here. We have RJ Young. <clears throat> he's, you know, the college, big college Fox. I don't watch him for any kind of, I have like my knowledge of college football is pretty second to none because I went to Gonzaga and we don't have any college football, but he had his power rankings this week. Uh, New Jersey, number one, Houston, number two, Birmingham, number three. And his rationale behind it was, well, Houston beat Birmingham. They were undefeated. I guess, first off, stop down on that. What do you think about Birmingham finally losing and going now? What are they? Seven, or eight and one? Right. And uh, I think that it was kind of a long time coming. Uh, they've been squeaking by lately, uh, have not looked great, uh, even had to pull out a bit of trickery to, to really outdistance Pittsburgh, who looks uh, like the worst team in the league. Uh, so not surprised by that. Uh, in regards to the power rankings, uh, kind of my thoughts are, if you're going to make them a joke, why do them? Uh, if it's not going to be a serious thing, just 
save us all. You know, if we want comedy, we can turn something else on. But uh, if you if it's going to be a joke, don't do them. Wow, that was a lot more fire than I expected from you this morning. That's good. And, you know, I look at uh, Fox's handling on some of this and it's just, OK, it's all in-house. Uh, is it now comedy or what are we doing here with this program? Uh, do am I watching a drama or am I watching a comedy? And so you know, let's let's uh, let's figure out a strategy here where we take this all seriously, at least to you know the degree that professional sports should be taken seriously, and and let's put out a good, honest effort. Uh, the the fact that Fox has kept this all in house with their own people. Uh, you know, I think that if you're looking at another part of their strategy that's been flawed from day one, that's it. Uh, they they haven't reached out to other media. They haven't really uh, made any inroads, I don't think, uh, with others. So uh, it it bothers me a little bit just to see that that, that, that would be the official power rating still. Yeah. Well, this this tells me that we and this has been the case, and I I wasn't sure with RJ right because we we've seen Coward, you know, we've seen him read the highlights, we've seen seen Skip and Shannon talk, you know, highlights through on their program. Very clear, none of them are watching the game right because they thought that Clayton Tor- uh, Thorson was like the best quarterback in the league because that was the highlights that he was that you know that Skip and Shannon were were fed to talk about. Uh, RJ was in Birmingham. I saw him at the Southern Kitchen. Like we were getting ready for our live show, he was there. So like I know he was in Birmingham for the kickoff, but. It's very clear to me now that R.J. Young does not watch any USFL product because I don't know how you would watch the product and then put out put out the power rankings this week. And like you said, that's alarming to me more than I thought he was like the one guy of anyone. OK, they're feeding him the victor or uh, whatever. Um, there is victors every week and they're feeding him the shark dog and we're doing all the things. And, and like he at least is really paying attention to this. Right. He His name's on all these articles. I don't I don't think he watches the product now. And that's very alarming to me. No, you know, and I think that that's uh, part of the problem with keeping this in-house, but keeping it in-house means that it's going to be a secondary thing for anybody uh, who's being paid to cover it. Uh, So it's, uh, you you just don't put a team with only two wins as your your number two in the power rankings and, and have it be taken seriously you know maybe i'm pounding on this a little bit too much but to me uh that's kind of the official thing because it comes from fox and so for you to do that uh it just takes away credibility i think uh in terms of the actual power rankings i mean i do think new jersey number one right i think that they've you know say for for the first week the birmingham kind of thing are we you know so we have the playoffs right we have jersey and philadelphia and then we have new orleans and birmingham uh any surprises there of the final four and i want to get your thoughts on, on moving forward to the championship so uh, two uh, two teams that i'm not actually surprised are there uh, are philadelphia and new jersey because they have coaches that are experienced in these developmental leagues. Uh, they, they picked guys who know what they're doing with this level of players. Uh, New Orleans uh, and Birmingham, uh, to me, Birmingham would kind of be that surprise. Uh, you know, we'll see if they, if, you know, the shine is off of them now, uh, but they did a, a, a great job assembling a roster uh, haven't always won pretty, but they've done enough to win. Uh, and then New Orleans, I've, I've always felt that New Orleans has a lot of talent on that roster, uh, especially defensively. But if you look at the quarterback position, that that also appeared to be a strength at one time. They don't always play up to that potential, unfortunately. I think it's good. I think obviously the game of the weekend, really excited for Philadelphia and New Jersey. That's, you know, Mike's been covering the, uh, the generals. I, I, with the stars are my team. Did we ever get your, who's Paul Reese? Like, who are you rooting for in the USFL? No, we haven't. And I've, I've kind of had a hard time um, picking. Uh, it has been fun to see the stars resurgence, uh, especially after losing their starting quarterback. So that's, that's been a lot of fun, but it is, um, you know, it's really kind of hard to to differentiate these teams at times. It seems like uh, everybody's running a short throw or the quarterback take off and run offense. Uh, and, uh, you know, I 
I, I emailed you earlier in the week that I ran some numbers on this and uh, just these USFL offenses, the, if they were, if this was the NFL, the yards per attempt would be the lowest since 1944. The yards per completion would be the lowest in recorded NFL history. <laughs> and that goes back to 1932. And the passing yards a game are actually the lowest in almost 30 years. So if it seems like these teams, it's kind of a slog on offense uh, compared to what we've seen out of professional football in the last 30 years, it certainly is. So that, I think that's made it a little bit difficult to, to really grab on to any team. Uh, there's been a, a lack of consistency week to week. I mean, the, the stars look like world beaters for a little while, and then they look like they can't get out of their own way all of a sudden. Uh, and I, almost everybody else, except maybe New Jersey, who, who just has this tough nose, pull through them uh, type of offense. Uh, and they seem to be just as good with Perez behind center, uh, even though he doesn't have to pass a lot. So it, it's, it's been hard to kind of pick a star, uh, particularly offensively, and, and just want to watch them week after week. What do you attribute that to? Because, you know, yeah, you would email me those stats. Um, I'm glad that we could talk about it because, like, you know, we're past, okay, we, we've had enough reps now. We're past training camp. I did the first couple weeks, drag that down. Is it the roster size? Is it the talent level? I mean, what do you attribute that to? Yeah, so I don't think it was just the first couple of weeks. Uh, you look at this past weekend and uh, you had uh, six out of eight teams that couldn't score 20 points. Uh, and the highest score of the weekend was 25 points. So it wasn't uh, just those first couple of weeks. Uh, if anything, I think that the numbers went down. I think there was one more interception than touchdown thrown this past weekend, which is incredible in 2022. Uh, you know, you do have to wonder about talent. Uh, the second part is that uh, you had Mike Pereira on during one of the lightning delays earlier in the year um, saying that, you know, every other league has had to, modify its rules to make the quarterbacks look better. But he was kind of crowing that they hadn't had to do that, and yet scoring was up. I don't think he's right. I think that scoring's gone back down. I think you saw a little bit of an aberration maybe for a couple of weeks. Uh, offenses are down, though, and I, I would certainly uh, look at some modified rules to make the passing game work a little bit better. Yeah, it's weird. I, you know, I've watched all this USFL stuff. You know, we've been podcasting the whole time. You know, I get a lot of like, you know, Reed hates all this. I've done my best. Really busy time of year for us to watch as many of these games as I, as, as I can, but I do. Uh, watching the CFL this last weekend, watch the kickoff Thursday, and then I literally had... I, I like because I film weddings. I have this like I'm probably the worst person in the world, but I have like a mount for my camera so I can like watch the games while I'm kind of like just like during the reception, like when there's like you know we're just kind of hanging around, but it kind of looks like I'm working. I was watching the C. I was watching the BC Lions absolutely demolish the Edmonton, like you know, fifty nine to fifteen. It was the greatest night of my life. But I I hadn't got as excited about a football game. And as I have in the last, whether we, you know, nine, 10 weeks here, right? Going USFL going into the weekend. And, and I don't know what that is because BC doesn't play. Like, that's not my, I mean, that's my team, but that's not my home team. I mean, they don't play here. They don't even play in this country. And yet, I don't know if it's, it's just the league's done better, you know, working with us to reach out, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, um, a human, right? If a team is nice to me, like there's certain CFL teams I like because their media people are easier to work with than others. Saskatchewan Rough Riders, very challenging sometimes. But like, I, I just, I, I miss that excitement, and, and I don't know why I haven't felt that way with the USFL. Obviously, we were there the first weekend. Kickoff was very exciting, but it hasn't had a lot of um, really exciting moments that way that really grip you in. If that makes sense, right, right. And I, I, I go back to the crowds, and I, it's not only the crowds as background and action shots. It's the way that the players react to the crowds. It's the way that the announcers have to raise their voices to be heard above the crowds. It's, it's all that excitement that comes from a live atmosphere. And, uh, you know, I think that that's what this past weekend of CFL action gave us again, that the USFL doesn't give us three out of four games. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I was watching the Philadelphia Pittsburgh game on uh, what was it Sunday night? A couple of tremendous hits in that game late by the Philadelphia defense. 
And yet there's no ooing from the crowd. There's no, it's just not the same. So yes, the play uh, is there, but you're, you're not taking it in the same, you know, just in some kind of visceral sense with that, that ooing of the crowd or even a cut to the reaction of the way that the players play to a crowd after scoring. It's just, there's something being taken away from your product not being in front of crowds and even in front of the away crowd uh, or finding a, a relative in the stands, all those things that we, we have just taken in as part of the televised product it just aren't there three out of four games for the USFL. I, and I mean, you know, in CFL, they've got it. They've had attendance issues this last weekend. I mean, I, I don't want to give them a free pass here, right? We're talking attendance. Like BC did a really good job. They had like 34,000 people. I mean, that was a once in a lifetime concert kickoff. You know, we'll see what they do uh, week after next because, of course, they have a buy because CFL only has nine teams. But, um, you know, uh, like Saskatchewan, they really struggled. And I, and I, you know, I always hear like, well, Saskatchewan's like the size of California and everyone travels in. And, you know, I think gas prices and stuff. I mean, attendance is an issue for all of these leagues. So I don't want to pass on that. But I will say that the CFL does do a better job of filming their games not just showing empty stands the whole time where USFL does feel like we shoot this game, whether there's 30,000 people in the stands or whether there's five people, we shoot it the exact same way. And I've never agreed with that. I think they could have done a better job piping in some crowd noise, at least getting everyone on one side of the field and then yeah, just framing the game tighter and not showing this cavern. Right. And I, I do wonder if part of the issue with the, with Fox is that they wanted to show off their innovations. So when you show off the, the drone cam, uh, you're going to catch some empty stands. So, you know, I, I, I can see your point there that it would have been better to tighten up a little bit uh, because it, it really detracts from the product when you're seeing not just uh, not just even what you you see occasionally in the CFL with some empty patches of stands, but largely empty stands like, oh, I might be able to actually count the people who are here. There's so few people. Uh, that's what we've seen in the USFL three out of four games. Uh, so just to put a pin in this for the weekend. So Stars Generals, now that's a 9 a.m. like. Again, this flex scheduling here. So you have, well, I guess this weekend doesn't matter, right? So it's week after next. So we, it's going to be back to back. So that's weird because I, I don't, okay, so we're looking at the schedule here. So n none of these games really matter this weekend. We have stars, generals, but then we're going to, we're going to flip that back to back then the next week. That's interesting on USA. Uh, Birmingham, Tampa, Michigan uh, against Pittsburgh, New Orleans against Gamblers. I wonder how ratings hold up this week because some of the games last weekend that did didn't matter, got decent ratings of the ones that did. Like, it didn't necessarily correlate. It wasn't like, because uh, Breakers Bandits got 742, and that game mattered, and Generals Panthers on NBC got 815,000, and that game didn't matter. So I, I think part of that is networks and time slots, but it's weird because, like, that game, you know, it's weird that, to have a game have no matter at all, but still beat the other one by, you know, what is that, 65, 70,000 people. Right, right. Networks, time slots, and competition. And so I think what we're establishing is kind of your base level for who's going to watch football. And if it's against two one and eight teams, who's out there who's going to watch it? Uh, so we're, we're kind of establishing our floor. Now, if games uh, start to matter, what, do, what can we add to that? Can, do we add 100,000 fans? Do we add 200,000 or more? Uh, these are all the things that I hope, you know, Fox is looking at. What, what would your ratings predictions be for the championship game? You know, what is that? The weekend of the third? That is a tough weekend. That's a holiday weekend. You've got a lot of people away. Uh, it will, uh, personally, if they hit somewhere in the million, million and a half range, I would consider that a sparkling success that shows interest in the product and people going out of their way to find it. Find it. Uh, I'm yeah. I will see. They have you know. What, what, is it Trace? What's the guy that's playing the playoff game? Um, is it Trace Atkins? Is that yeah? So he's playing. Like I think that's smart, but it's still. 
we still have the issue of like the two games he's playing in between. It's a two hour break. The next week, like I don't know if the USFL championship in and of itself is enough to draw that many people to camp. I'll be curious. I mean, I want it to be good. It's not the biggest stadium in the world. I think it holds like 20,000. So I think that that'll be fine, but it really curious to see here coming out, you know, Legion, all, all these weeks now are weird. We're done with protective field, which is uh, kind of weird to think. Cause I'm sure they've lived there for the last, you know, three months and now moving on. Any final thoughts from you? I mean, you know, we talked to tenants. I hate hammering on that, but I do know what you mean. I think it's, you know, the kind of the prevailing topic, any other takeaways before we get out of here? Right, right. And again, the attendance, we're not hammering on it from an economic perspective. I know some, so many people will say, what is wrong with you guys? Don't you understand the attendance doesn't matter. What we're talking about is how it affects your core product. And that's the television product. So uh, please don't misunderstand kind of the argument that we're making here. That This is about the optics and about how it affects the core product of the television show. Um, but again, here we are uh, entering week 10. We're going to finish the season. Uh, they, they're going to finish, which is uh, far and away the biggest overall goal of the league had coming into the season. Uh, certainly some tweaks that could be made. Uh, I think that the television coverage in and of itself has been uh, pretty solid. I think that Fox has shown that they they know that they need to standardize broadcast slots so people know when to find the games. They're going to have to figure out uh, how something like Peacock and streaming works into their plans. And maybe if there's a way to, to just streamline the schedule a little bit, uh, I don't think that they did them and themselves any favor by announcing games just two weeks out think that that was a mistake open up the same windows that the nfl has so that the last four weeks or whatever you can flex out games that that's your flexibility in the schedule otherwise people know when the games are being played uh so lots of improvements that could be made but the overall big picture hey we're going to complete a season uh, even though we did, even though we did complete two seasons with the spring league well we had the, the one was kind of abbreviated we came back i don't i don't like that I don't love that narrative that like this is Fox finally completing this because I I covered eight weeks or whatever of the spring league you know last summer so I don't I don't feel like that is as big an accomplishment as they do obviously they don't care what I think but I I would argue that that's not in and of itself the victory so and to me the spring league was completely off my radar because uh, players paying to be in it I mean it had all the makings I. By definition, I looked at it as you know a semi-professional effort. Uh, this is players are being paid. That's a that's a big deal. That when tens of millions uh, are going into this, I think mean, Fox uh, initially talked about fifty million. I'd be surprised if it wasn't much more than that. That went into the league this last year. So guys are able to actually uh, concentrate on this. And I think it draws a little bit uh, higher level of player. Uh, so that that that's the distinction that I'd make when it comes to to paying everybody. Uh, you know, they've they've done it. it. It has been a hybrid thing with all being based in a hub city. Uh, but it, to me, it's been a much different animal than the spring league. Yeah, and just to talk about the flex before we get out, you know, that was the whole thing. We announced the games two weeks out. I don't feel like a tremendous amount of flexing was done. So like you said, the benefit of, you know, if we're trying to figure out like, what do we do for next season, right? Because everyone, okay, it's coming back. Like I just saw Seth tweet, okay, we, we're having USFL trading cards. Okay, that's a good thing. Like these are all good signs. That, okay, they're coming back. Fox is happy with it. So like if you're going to do the two weeks out, at least utilizing the flex of games. I don't feel like any of these have been flexed particularly well. So either announce the games, announce the times, except for maybe the last two weeks when teams are in or out of playoff contention, but then standardize the games going forward because you're, you're hurting yourself on both sides right now because people can't plan accordingly. And then you're also not presenting the best matchups when they need to be presented. Right. And even those viewership numbers that you presented earlier may show that it just doesn't really matter here. Here we tried to flex in a, a, you know, our only marquee game of week nine and it drew less than a game that didn't matter. So maybe you just need to set your schedule and the value in setting that schedule uh, really is going to be greater than any value gleaned from trying to shuffle a matchup into your best slot. 
People are very weird. People in general, it's really hard. And you know, even these TV ratings and how's Nielsen work and it's, you know, the journals. And I used to work in news and we'd have sweeps weeks. I'm like, wait, what? So like we send out diaries, like, and people like write in them with it. <laughs> so, you know, like you just want, so we would like hammer home, like, uh, cause I worked at the NBC in Bakersfield and we would want like, we would just hammer everything the last week of the sweeps because you wanted them to remember like, Oh, okay. KGET. Like I watched that. It didn't matter if they had watched you the other five weeks. Like you just wanted that last memory of them uh, to be anyway, uh, Paul, this has been good. Hopefully we didn't hammer on attendance too much, but I, I think it's always great getting your insights. We'll probably do a post more of them. Like I said, after the season, depending on your schedule, but I uh, really appreciate you coming on. All right. Thanks so much for having me Reed. Well, I'm excited here. We're continuing our USFL discussion. We just talked to USFL historian Paul Reese. We're continuing. We're approaching USFL Week 10 here. We have Coach Craig, uh, fantasy writer. Uh, Craig, why don't you tell us who you are and, and who you write for and why we should listen to you? Yeah, hey, uh, so my name is Craig. Uh, most people refer to me as Coach Craig. I write for True North Fantasy Football. Haven't done too much there recently. Uh, WeBetATS.com. During the NBA season, I wrote a couple of trade deadline articles there. I have daily MLB DFS video or uh, articles and cheat sheets that come out over there. I have daily MLB DFS videos that come out on my own channel, Coach Craig Sports. Uh, once we get back around to football season, we'll be doing some or NFL season, we'll put it that way, because I've been doing the USFL uh, DFS as well. I first started off doing the videos, but just based on like a lot of the time where we got the information of like who's going to be inactive and inactive, like it was just kind of rushed to squeeze it all in. So I started doing posts and it was more like who you should play in like a GPP setting, a cash game setting, who were kind of riskier plays to play, which has kind of varied a lot week to week, even <laughs> figuring out who's kind of going to be the safe play and who's not, especially with some of the quarterback situations. Uh, so I've been doing that. Uh, once we get back around to the NFL regular season, I do NFL DFS and NBA DFS as well. Did a decent amount of fantasy football in the past, but I'm kind of cutting back on that um, at this point in time. Well, good. So we're talking USFL today. Uh, I kind of, like I said, we had Paul on yesterday. For this can be on the show uh, before the this USFL, you know, the all USFL team, uh, you know, offense, defense, all that was announced. I also want to get your thoughts on Week Ten and then kind of playoff predictions. It is weird. We've been doing this. At, at Evan Wilsmore, one of the writers at USFL News Hub, has been doing this kind of all season anyway, this all USFL team. Uh, for someone that, that doesn't maybe follow, I, I don't, what, what does this mean to me? What is the all USFL team offense, defense, and special teams? I think mainly it's just kind of picking the best guys at their respective positions. It's similar to, you know, like kind of like a Pro Bowl for the NFL or like an all star game for any other different level where if you're talking like college football like all american list type of thing but you know it's just shine on them i think they kind of favored some of the where there's a little bit of controversy maybe is um some of the selections they made maybe they favored the guys that had a little bit better uh team record overall you said it's weird interesting that they release this you know, we still have one more week of regular oh, yeah. season what is interesting to me too is today aaron wilson tweeted he's an nfl insider that yep. you know the usfl players are able to pursue you know nfl opportunities now and that's kind of accurate that's kind of inaccurate because usfl would have to release them depending on when their contract was signed it might revert back to the usfl my question is like, are a lot of guys not showing up this weekend? Like, is that, are we worried that like guys are just, I, I we're out of the playoffs. I'm not playing. Yeah, that could be an interesting situation. And then like, if you're still like in the, like you get to the playoffs, then you don't want to just, just say like Darius Victor, for example, you don't want him like signing with the Eagles all of a sudden. And then he's not there for the playoff game or something like that. So there's, there's kind of some, they got to have some type of way around it. I'm not sure exactly how the USFL has its structure. I know different leagues in the past have done it different ways, um, whether it was the AAF or the XFL too. So, And it was really interesting seeing this year after the NFL draft took place, some of those guys that were UDFAs out of this year's rookie class that didn't sign, there was a couple of them that leaked into the USFL, but it was kind of later on in the season. So those guys really didn't get opportunities. I know D Anderson was one. God, I can't remember where exactly he was from out of college. I, I want to say like Alabama State. I know he went to a bigger school first, then he transferred there, but he actually put up pretty uh, good pro day measurables too. So I was kind of surprised that he didn't get like on the practice squad with another team, but it could be kind of interesting, especially when we move to next year, like with USFL and the XFL, some of those UDFAs, maybe they play in that 
one of those two leagues to start off with and then try to you know, springboard that maybe to a bigger undrafted free agent contract or even a little bit of leverage in either one of those leagues. Well, and now we're you know, talking, I just had Greg, I just wrapped with Greg Parks. We're talking more XFL on his interview, mm-hmm. but here we are mid June. If you were to pursue a contract, I mean, what do you think about like, I'm trying to get into an NFL camp now, middle of June with OTAs going on. It, it's, it's an interesting situation just because you, you're like at this, I'm, Cause you're kind of stuck. Like they already missed kind of the OTAs. We're kind of like a mini camp. It's kind of like this awkward situation, but I mean, like if a guy is good enough, he can do it, but like they're still behind the ball. Like if you're, especially if you're waiting to this and then like, I know when the XFL was kind of around, they were talking about, would you, I know I can't remember who brought it up because it's been a while, but like some of these guys, like, would you rather go fight for, being the 52nd or 53rd guy on the roster or practice scud spot, or just become like the star in one of these leagues and get paid a little bit more than you would on like the practice squad or something. Well, I mean, NFL practice squad, I think considerably a lot more pay than it depends if you're a good enough quarterback, if the USFL wants to pay you for that, right? I think Mm -hmm. Tiamu got a higher contract. I think a couple of the guys I've heard rumored, but uh, Mm -hmm. you know, XFL obviously, uh, you know, in 2020 was paying that like 250,000 or more for the quarterbacks, but Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, do you want to be PJ Walker in the XFL running wild, or like you said, you're Jordan Tiamu, you're filling in in Kansas City, and then being let go every other week? Yeah, just being on the practice squad, and the, those practice squad guys are making like eight to ten thousand dollars a week. So if you stick on all year, you get like uh, you know one hundred eighty thousand. But if you don't, then you just bounce around, and that's what a lot of these guys have done previously in their careers. They were bouncing around practice squad to practice squad, or trying to be ready all the time. So that's kind of the importance of these leagues, even if you're not either you're getting back into the NFL or you're just continuing the sport that you love to play. So I'm looking here. I got the all team or all USFL team offense, right? So Kyle Slaughter, that's, you know, they picked number one on that. Darius Victor, Reggie Corbin, Victor Bolden. I'm not going to go down, but the little Sal Canella, very happy friend of the show. Sal Canella is on there for tight end. Mm-hmm. Anybody on offense that maybe you're surprised, like is Kyle Slaughter, is he, is he the best quarterback in the USFL? So that's kind of the one that sticks out. He has the most passing yards, but he's like fifth in touchdowns. And, you know, he's got 11 interceptions too. So like you can make an argument that probably should just be Jordan Tejamo because he's second in yards. He's got more touchdowns. They got the same amount of interceptions and he obviously can run the ball. So, but like, that's kind of where you get down to maybe the team record there too. Um, so it's a little bit interesting. It's been a really interesting year for quarterback too, because there's not, you know, like when we watched the XFL, there was guys there were, you know, Jordan Tiamo, PJ Walker, and Josh Johnson kind of took over where they were the three higher up guys. We didn't really see that quite as much with the USFL. And even like in a case of Jordan Tiamo, I think he actually probably played worse in the USFL than he did in the XFL. Yeah, what do you make of that? I've I've talked with people over the weeks about that. That I mean, I think people came in and thought he was going to be like Jesus walking on water. I mean, I mean that like guys got so much experience, been in the NFL. Yeah, it'd be like if PJ Walker came back. I mean, sometimes it's like when you're on Survivor and then you come back for the All Stars and you're like, oh, this guy's going to run crazy, and then they get voted out first because maybe everyone knows or they're 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 thinking too hard. And I mean, that's kind of been Tayamu, right? He's kind of overthinking mm-hmm. everything. What have you made of his performance? Uh, I mean, it's just the inconsistencies, and it's kind of something that's been with him for a long time. Like you go back to Ole Miss, like. He had AJ Brown, DK Metcalf, Dawson Knox. Like he had a whole stack team around him. He had like I can't even remember the yardage number, but he was either first or second in the SEC that year, and he only threw 19 touchdowns with a stacked like weapons around him. So it was just I don't know. It's just one of those weird things. It's like he has the flashes, and when they're there, they're there. But then like you see other games where it's just like oh he missed like five straight passes, and it's just and I know. Um, God, I can't even think of the coach's name right now. Uh, Tampa Bay's coach. Oh, oh uh, Todd Haley. Todd Haley. I knew it was Todd, but I'm like, I can't think of his last name. And he even talked about it too, some of his inconsistencies and how he drops his elbow and all this stuff. And he just wants to make quicker decisions and stuff like that. So he's really talked about it. I think maybe it comes down to some of that is like he kind of tried to hide him, um, put him in like to higher expectations. And it's trying to push him to be better and it's kind of like put more pressure on him maybe instead of kind of playing loose and like what he's comfortable with at the same time. Uh, Look at your, you know, running back, right? Reggie Corbin, Darius Victor. You know, Victor has been really good. Uh, Matt Colburn, surprising he didn't make the all USFL team. Well, 
I think those two guys are pretty much shoe ins because Corburn has been really good. Obviously, he got hurt and he didn't play last week. Colburn was kind of he's kind of been there all year, but he's kind of had the bigger weeks as of late, too. So uh, he's a guy I liked a lot when he was in the XFL. And him and Victor were there together, if I remember correctly. It's been a minute, but uh, with New York, but I, I thought he was going to have a bigger year. And then Howell was kind of around, and he was kind of injured. Paul Terry was used for a little bit, and then they just like stopped using him. And then Colbert, like, it's been hard to figure out Philadelphia some weeks. They're just like, one week it's this guy, the next week it's this guy. Like, uh, even the week before, it was like, hey, Cook. Case Cook is, I'm like kicking myself because I didn't have enough exposure to DFS and he had the monster game with like four touchdowns, a long touchdown run. And then he comes out last week and he can't like hit the broad side of a barn. So, yeah, he ran, was it, it was 69 or 79 yard CD 79. run? Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Uh, so, obviously, Philadelphia is, you know, they're playing New York this weekend and back to back. This weekend doesn't yeah. count. Next weekend, then we'll count for the playoffs. Do you think that Philadelphia has any chance in, uh, you know, take in the North or is that, uh, was it New Jersey? Is that their, is that their, mm. whatever their division to lose? I mean, they definitely have a chance because they got enough offensive playmakers and everything too. It kind of depends if Holland's ever healthy enough to play again. Cause he's an explosive running back. He's just kind of big. He's all or nothing kind of, you know, that kind of, it's Saquon Barkley version type of runner where it's like, you get a really long run, but then sometimes there's just not much there. And, It'll be interesting to see like what kind of performance we get out of Cookus going forward too. Cause last week he got benched for my boy, KJ Costello, who uh, that's like a whole nother story for a different day. But like back in 2018, he was one of the best quarterbacks in all of college football. Then uh, I think it was the beginning of 2019, he played Northwestern. Dude doesn't know how to slide to save his life. Gets knocked on the head and he's never been the same quarterback since he had the one game with Mississippi state, the first game there where he threw for like 532 yards and like six touchdowns against the defending champion LSU. And everybody was like, Oh my God. And I was really excited about that too at the time. Cause it's like, he played in the pro offense. They play in a spread offense or kind of spread air raid, I guess. Um, and Mississippi state. So I was like, Oh, if he can do all this and continue it. And then the wheels just fell off from there. So, uh, it was kind of interesting, but I've always wanted him to kind of get going again. So I was really excited when he, uh, came back, so uh, I didn't really get a chance to see that game. But it'll be interesting to see kind of what kind of happens with that because he's probably better talent wise than Cookus, but Cookus is a guy that's been in the system for like two years too. So yeah, it's surprising. I mean, happy you know Brian Scott, obviously friend of the show. We didn't want to see him go down and be injured, yeah. but uh, it's really surprising that the team really has you know Cookus. He's getting a lot of publicity now with that. I mean, I could I could have seen him on this all USFL team. I mean, maybe that's just Philadelphia's my team. Maybe that's just my mm-hmm. bias. But uh, I mean, to to be able to come into that position midway through the season and, and still have your team be here to you know in the semifinals, whatever you want to call it, of the playoffs is you know it's impressive. Yeah, and I, like you mentioned, I think it's going to be really interesting to see like how those teams and how some of these teams play it out this week too, whether. Maybe they don't play Cookus this week and they play Costello, see what he's got and just kind of some of these other guys. And maybe I think with some other teams, like when you talk about like New Orleans or something, like do they just not even play Kyle Soder this week? Because he got kind of banged up again last week. So it's like maybe you play, uh, was it Zach Smith there or heck you even bring Shea Patterson off the inactive list and then just kind of rule with him like Ezra Gray and like all these other guys and just kind of not risk all the higher people, which I kind of mentioned when we talked a little bit, be interested to see how some of these teams play it out. Cause you know, like with the NFL, there is some of these guys, but you got a lot smaller roster here too. So you don't have as many opportunities to do that. I mean, the one thing with with these injuries and with the quarterback, and, and obviously it happens in the NFL. I think it's just exacerbated because it's a smaller schedule, the smaller teams. But like, you know, having like Shea Patterson now, he's not even playing anymore. You know, Kyle's been beat up. You know, Brian Scott got injured. Right, Cookus is here. Uh, Paxton Lynch, same kind of thing. It's weird where it's almost like team by committee towards the end of the season. Like it's not mm-hmm. feeling like this has been the full gang for a lot of these. I mean, New York uh, has been, or Jersey, right, has been separate kind mm-hmm. of that way. And, and it, but even Birmingham, you know, it's kind of been back and forth. You know, who's the starting quarterback? It's just, I would have liked, I like having the consistency. I like knowing who my QB1 is the whole way through. 
Yeah, and I think that's kind of been the biggest thing for this league too. Is you've not seen the like the big, big point scoring weeks, and a lot of it comes down to the quarterback playing, guys getting injured, and kind of rotating in and out. That's kind of been the biggest thing. Even when you talk about Birmingham, I think they could be a lot better team if Magoo would have stayed healthy all year. But like at the same time, you got Jamar Smith there that's been in that offense. He knows how to play it, but he's another guy that's super inconsistent at times too. So he'll be really hot at one moment, and then he'll just be missing a lot of throws after that. And that's like, you know, people will knock the product because of that, but there's a reason that these guys are playing in this league too. And they're not bad players by any means. These guys were still very good players at their respective colleges. They were their best player in high school. So these aren't bad players by any means. It's just weird. It's like, we're going to take guys that it's the same, same with the CFL. Sometimes you know, we cover that. And obviously mm-hmm. like, I think the three downs, I mean, don't tell, I think CFL would benefit from having that fourth down. Cause it's like, <laughs> okay, we're bringing in guys that, aren't quite at the level and then giving them less opportunities, right. To, to be able to score, right. Less chances. And, you know, you have to rush for more yards every time. Same with the USFL, right. Okay. We're going to get guys that are almost there, but we're going to give them two weeks of training camp, throw them in tiny ass rosters. You know, you're practicing in a hundred degree Birmingham heat, you know, you're living there, you know, you got to live off, you know, you're paying for your, I just, we're adding a lot of like mm-hmm. things here that I think if you would have taken care of a little bit more things, maybe you're not putting so much on these guys' shoulders. Mm-hmm. And just to that point too, I think that's one of the things that I did really like about like the XFL is they kind of had that accelerated play clock. So you get more plays and you get more opportunities and everything to see it too. And kind of the thing that they did too, that I liked was kind of like, I think they called it team nine which was kind of just the free agent teams that were practicing too. So then when you need to go sign somebody, you can just sign somebody off of there essentially instead of being like, who the heck's available at this point in time too. So there's a lot of things that are good and are bad and they copied some things. And, you know, you got to remember this is an inaugural season too. So there's going to be bumps in the road and it's going to be, I don't even know how to phrase it, but you know, there's a lot to figure out still. Uh, what, what that's a good question because I I get yelled at a lot online for like things I would fix. Like, what is the one thing you think the USFL needs to fix for next season? I think it's a hard question too because hmm, they just gotta have like. I'm not sure they quite have that differentiation factor yet. I I guess the overtime kind of um, is at this point in time, but we've only seen that kind of shootout format once this season. So uh, I'd like to, you know, they took and adapted some things from the XFL that were really good in my opinion. So just, I think that's going to be the hardest part next year is when you have both leagues together because you want the, a little bit better quality quarterback play than I think we've seen this year. But now you're competing with a couple different leagues. And I think there's some guys that were kind of surprises that just like the USFL didn't try to go after for whatever reason that could have been playing in this league. Um and then, because I mean, even like when we're talking about it, when they did the draft, the, like Luis Perez wasn't even drafted. Um there's a lot of different guys that could be potential guys to go after. We'll just have to see, really. Well, it's, it's hard. Like we had uh, Adam Levitan on. He's I think he's with Establish the Run. Uh, you know, talking earlier this season, and it's like, you know, what he's talking. You know, he does DFS and all that too. It's like it's the NFL, but not quite right. And that's mm-hmm. why I I do like the CFL game more, just because like it is its own thing. It's really not trying to mm-hmm. be anything. It looks very different. It feels very different. Obviously. You know, if you watch football, you can turn it on and kind of figure it out. But where this, even with all the bells and whistles they have, okay, the extra points and the shootout and the play clock, you're not having coaches take advantage of that. We've seen very little go for three. I mean, I couldn't tell you the last time we had a two-point conversion. Obviously, we had the shootout overtime, which was good, but just felt slow. Like that, the only thing that made me want is to have seen the XFL one where it was best of uh, five or six and not best of three because it felt like it was over too quick. Mm. Like the one thing they stole, or even not stole, but one thing they borrowed, then it still just made me want to see the original more, you know? Mm-hmm. And this is kind of weird, but like the fan control league is like the extra points that they do, or it's just kind of like the one on one. Like even doing something like that, just throwing that little twist in could be something that's a little bit interesting. Like just, Mix it up just a little bit, even though you kind of take it from somewhere else once again. But it's hard to get too creative with football, though. But you got to have something that brings people in. And I think 
one of the biggest things was that it's all in Birmingham this year too. This kind of, you know, been one of the biggest knocks and everybody's like, Oh, well the attendance sucks. Well, you got seven other cities that can't really have people there. So, and I think they've been in talks uh, of adding like a second city next year, if I remember correctly. Well, yeah, that, we continue on that conversation. So we, I, I talked with Paul about that. So Daryl Johnson came out this week and said, because the original plan was eight cities in the hub, you know, this year, then maybe four and four next year, maybe. And then all mm-hmm. eight would be in their cities year three. Cause I think they have a three year, I don't think it's a signed contract. I think they have a three year kind of verbal agreement with Birmingham. I think year one here is, is signed. I'm sure someone will add mm-hmm. me if I'm wrong, but now, yeah, we have Gerald Johnson saying like, well, we'd really like to find another hub city to be able to do this. I'm like, so do you not have any, like, so we're not even at four, like we're at potentially a second one. I mean, yeah. do you think that that's odd here that, and, and obviously we have a long off season getting ready for next April, but then they're just now like pontificating, like, well, maybe we can find a second hub to do this. Mm-hmm. And I think it's going to be, once again, like once you go back to it next year and you have the USFL and the XFL, you're kind of competing at that point. So you're competing for cities, stadiums. I don't know that there's going to be a lot of overlap, but let's just say like New Jersey, well, you're not going to get MetLife if they're going to get MetLife, <laughs> if they if they use a, you know, New York again. So it's just like, there, you kind of have to rule out some at that point in time too. So I'm muting as I cough here. A little under the weather. We're podcasting under dress today. Uh, I don't know. I just would have liked to see more action being taken here. I, I know. Mm-hmm. I, I think I'm too critical. I think we're getting through the season and then we'll regroup. My fear is it's going to be July 3rd. The championship game is going to go. We're going to go to radio silence for six months. And it's like, we'll see you here next February whenever we started doing announcements mm-hmm. before. That's kind of my fear at this point. Mm-hmm. And it'll be interesting to see how they play out the off season too. Cause I don't remember the contract details for the USFL. Everybody's just kind of on like a one-year one, right? So it's a one year. So if you're an original signed player, they have to let you out of your contract and then you're able to sign with an NFL contract mm-hmm. midway through the season. I believe it was when they bumped up the rosters and practice squad. They added a clause where if you don't stick with an NFL squad, your contract reverts back to a second year USFL contract. Okay. Because yeah, I can't, that's kind of like always the weird part about these, you know, pop up spring leagues, whatever you want to call them, is just how the contracts are structured. I know like everything with the XFL initially was just like all one year contracts. And then I think they're going to start doing like some rollover thing where you could keep like so many people and they kind of have like another dispersal draft. So that's kind of the biggest thing is when you go into year two, how the team shake up, who's here still, who's not, and just kind of how you all separate that. Cause year two is probably the biggest one for any of these type of leagues, I would say. Yeah, really curious to see the continuity that six round. I mean, did three months of playing together now translate? Now here we get everyone back together next March. Like, does New Jersey run it again? Like, does that? I don't. I don't know how much continuity you have with twelve weeks of gameplay, and then we'll see you again next year. But maybe. I mean. The mm-hmm. spring league did that when the spring league and they had to break for like COVID and then they came back and played the championship game. Uh, the generals walked by a mile because they had most of the guys that were able to return, even mm-hmm. though they had only played for like six weeks. So, um, And even when it comes to coaching staffs too, as well, not just the players, because you know, like, are some of these coaches going to stick around or are they going to take a better position or should some of them be fired? That's a whole nother can of worms. And then even if you go with like Mike Riley, like, is he want to, is he going to want to do like another season with his age and obviously, you know, his wife. I think it's going to be interesting across the board. Uh, anything else? You know, we have the all defense here. I mean, it's not that exciting. These USFL. I've, <laughs> I think we have more fun talking about other stuff, which is always great. Any other final thoughts before I let you go here? I mean, Victor Bolden makes special teams for the all USFL as well. Gavante Turpin, right? Good standings mm-hmm. on that. Channing's uh, shriveling. Any other names? Any other thoughts before Let's I let see. you go? Uh, so I think special teams is pretty fair. I mean, there's a decent amount of kickers in this league that should be invited to NFL camps to at least try out essentially, or make it through the preseason, whether, you know, it's a Brandon Aubrey, who's a pretty good story, you know, a former soccer player, um, which similar career path to somebody like Josh Lambeau, who was pretty decent kicker for some time in the NFL. until his hip kind of betrayed him, but 
that's going to happen with most kickers eventually sooner or later. Um, but he, the Pittsburgh Maulers kicker, Ahmed, he's made some really, really long kicks this year too. So not the most accurate, but he's got the legs. So maybe if he can fix that, he could maybe get a spot in the NFL too. And then uh, Cole Murphy's came in and played pretty well. I think he's nine out of 10. Uh, I think defense, they pretty much got defense, right? I feel like for the most part, you can't really debate too much there. It's crazy how many more tackles Donald Payne has than like anybody else. <laughs> well, also Gambler is really the only representation on that. I mean, they've been known as a defensive yeah. force all season, right? I mean, you see Breggers with a lot of offense, New Jersey as well, mm-hmm. Birmingham, but you know, gamblers really haven't had a lot going for them except to be able to stop yeah. the teams every once in a while. I mean, Scooby would probably be close up there by him, but he's missed some games too. Scooby, right? Oh, Scooby, right? Didn't make it. No, nah. Demarcus uh, Demarcus Gates did though his teammate. What do you make of that? Scooby was like their big star. Yeah, but he's he's missed a lot of, wait, I think three games now. Shark Dog, right? He was the one that was uh, yeah. he was inspiring the nation. That's interesting. You know, I this is all publicity anyway. I would put Scooby on the list. Well, it's kind of weird too, just because like he's a very interesting guy because he's you know. First team All American in college, kind of went to the NFL, didn't work out. He keeps playing in these leagues, but he never like he never really tries to go back to the NFL after he plays in these leagues, though. So it's just he's just like I'm just playing for fun, pretty much. Uh, well, Craig, this has been fun. I could talk to you for a while longer. I gotta mm-hmm. hop off. I have another interview here. Uh, we have Keon Hatcher of the BC Lions. Happy to talk with him in a minute. Uh, thank you all so much, uh, you know, for coming on. Anything you want to plug before I let you go? Yeah. So just once again. Mainly check out the webetats.com uh, for a daily MLB DFS cheat sheet. And then my uh, then my YouTube page at Coach Craig Sports, obviously. And then obviously once fantasy football season gets rolling, uh, True North Fantasy Football. And then Sons of Dynasty, I do some media stuff for them as well. Perfect. Well, this went quick. This was a fast one. I look at the clock. Next thing I know, but I thank you so much for your mm-hmm. time. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate all of our guests coming on today. Greg Parks, getting ready to you know, head out of town for the XFL Showcase and taking the time to sit down and talk. Really appreciate that. Tim Baines, always busy covering the CFL stuff. We're deep in the, you know, in, entrenched in the season now. Week two, uh, Keon Hatcher, as I already said at the top of the show, taking time out from his vacation. Matt Baker, everyone over at the BC Lions. Uh, got some CFL guys coming up next week as well. Really excited. I think I'm going to kind of be able to break through that barrier I know they're a little protective up there of doing too many player Zoom interviews, but I am hoping that the inroads we made in the offseason will allow us uh, still continued access uh, to players from certain teams where I'm, I'm maybe more friendly with than others. You know, certain teams just have better, uh, not better, but they just have more kind of adaptable, uh, you know, team, social media rep. Uh, what do you call that? PR people, right? Like Matt Baker. We have Max uh, Campbell over at uh, Calgary. And uh, yeah, Francis over at Alouette. So I think I think we're still going to get some player interviews. And then obviously Paul Reese for coming on and Coach Craig Sports. Really appreciate that. Rambling so much today. I can like barely see right now. I'm really just going through this out of instinct at this point. So I hope this episode has been at least uh, uh, digest- yeah, understandable in any way today. Really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, now, drum roll, please. It is ready for our big 2,000 subscriber giveaway. So you have to be subscribed to the channel. I will go check. That is A number one. You have to be subscribed to the markass.com. If you only listen to the audio, if you go read, I don't have a YouTube. I refuse to get a YouTube because I don't want Alphabet stealing, you know, my you know, my information. Maybe you could uh, DM me on Twitter a screenshot of your subscribed, you know, podcast platform. If we really had to go that way, I would prefer you guys to be subscribed on YouTube. But I like this to be eligible to everybody. So uh, that's what we're going to do. Be subscribed on YouTube. Here are the items. And so what you're going to do, you're going to comment on the video. You have to comment on this video and say which items you would like to be eligible. So if you want the jersey or the hat or whatever, you you need to say like jersey, comma, hat, whatever. And then I'll go through, search the comments, figure out everyone, because not everyone might want everything. Anyone that's in a certain bubble, right? Okay, we all want the uh, Royal Retros jersey. Then we'll raffle off from that. So you go in and like you could put yourself in the runnings for everything, but you know, you might not want the Grey Cup stuff or whatever. So that is what we'll do. That way I know that whoever wins 
is going to be excited about that. So make sure you comment. I'm going to show you the items now and then get out of here because I'm just uh, gone rambling and too sick, whatever. We have two of these. They are gray cup toques, so you can either write hat or toque. Uh, these are really nice, um, you know, beanie, whatever things. These are official from a gray cup. This is, these are our lesser prizes, but you know, you're still eligible for that. I have two of these. Um, these are the Hamilton uh, gray cup uh, scarves that they gave away. Uh, we have two of these we're going to be auctioning off. I have one more item here. Stand by. Hopefully that wasn't too bad. Okay, we have, these are the Hamilton. I'm gonna try not to have to do too much editing on the show today. These are the Grey Cup tumblers. I'm sure that's great for audio listens. These are really nice. These are like really high-end uh, Grey Cup tumblers. These have been sitting in my office since the Grey Cup, but we have two of these we're gonna be giving away. If you want the Grey Cup, as I hit the microphone, if you want the Grey Cup tumbler, we have the scarf. I also have these, I'm not gonna raffle off, but if you want one of these to be included in your package when I mail it, we have two of these gray cup masks. I, I, I just can't, like, are we paying $5? If you really want one and you want to cover shipping, happy to figure that out. If you want, these are like official Hamilton gray cup uh, face coverings. We, I guess, still need those now, but uh, they're cool. It's like a cool, like, timepiece thing too, if you want that, you know, moment in time. I also have a ton of these. Royal Retros, Dustin gave us like a million of these at the USFL, that's upside down kickoff. Uh, again, I'm not gonna mail that off, but if you would like one of these included in your package, or uh, if you wanna pay for shipping, I'm happy to send, I think I have like eight probably of those. So we have the hat, tumbler, we have the scarves, and then here are the two big items I think people are gonna be most excited about. So this is the AAF, commander's jersey so you need to specify which jersey you want to be eligible for this is a size large this is a new old stock brand new it's literally been hanging in my locker since i got it on ebay came out fresh from the package i think it still has the tag on it i mean this tells you how i'm trying to like look here yep still got the tag so this is a size large if you want that i understand that won't fit everyone might be too big too small for whatever but if you want a large AAF Commander's jersey. And then the big grand prize, this is the Royal Retros jersey. You do not need to get the Dragons one. You will go on. Uh, you can customize whatever jersey you want with Dustin over at Royal Retros. He will mail it to you directly. I'll take care of, you know, that we'll... Dustin can just send me the bill and we'll take care of that. This is the one that Dustin gave me. I was able to do the custom mark cast. I got the 20 for XFL 2020 and the Dragons patch and all that stuff. But, excuse me, Dustin will take care of that. So, AF jersey, Royal Retros jersey, you need to specify. And then we have the hat, the scarves, all that stuff. So, comment on the YouTube. We'll do the big giveaway next week at the end of the show, hopefully. But follow directions if you want to be in any of this. If you've already won before, you can be eligible again. If you've never won, please, you know, uh, fill out something, you know, try to get some of this. This is all for the love. These are items that have been sitting in my office for a long time. Really excited to get them out to you guys. Really appreciate everyone getting this over the 2000 subscriber mark. I have definitely rambled long enough today. Thank you guys all so much for your love and support. Uh, good episode coming next week as well as we approach you know, midway, we're you're getting through the CFL season, uh, USFL playoffs and XFL stuff as it comes out. So thank you guys again.